from the deepest, darkest recesses of Dangerous Nerds headquarters, Keith Moncrief and Gary Cassell. Well, welcome so, uh, to the show, Dave. Um, that's, okay. That's Keith over there. Keith Moncrief. I can see Keith. I, yep, I got both of you right there. Now, you and I have talked. We've known each other for a few years. Um, right. Uh, I mean... Um, the first time you and I actually had a conversation was over trying to resolve the issue with freelance artists not having medical insurance. And you and I talked to the people at Moose down right. in Florida. Yep. And, Moose Lodge, and then, yep. And then both of us fumbled the ball and just never came back to it. Uh, yeah, I don't know if it's really something they could have helped us with um, anyway. Um, I think it's just the laws are so screwed up for, for independent contractors and, and freelancers and, and uh, uh, com companies that, that do it. I think they do certain things and not other things. And, and um, yeah, it's, it needs to be addressed at some point, but you know, we don't have a lobby in, uh, you know, in Congress for it. So that's not going to happen. Yeah, and uh, sadly, it's it's true, um, but it's such a problem because uh, uh, you know it's it's uh, around ten percent of all you know comic professionals make a decent living. It's like ninety percent of comic professionals doesn't matter if you're a writer, colorist, artist, what have you, are struggling, starving. Right, and and it's the same in, in you know the entertainment profession. It's the same with actors. Uh, you know, you only see the the top money makers, and and uh, uh, the rest are just you know um, secondary players who you know have to go paycheck to paycheck and show to show. Yeah, it's like uh, you know my my cousin was so shocked in L.A. at how many people she ran into that worked in restaurants that she had seen on TV. Yeah. So, I knew this person that kept looking at him. I'm like, well, yeah, that's what they do. Uh, you know, they have to work restaurant jobs usually. Right, right. And, and you know, that that's really no different than uh, uh, the freelance uh, business and, and art. Yeah. You know, if you, don't, if, you, if you don't work for a company that's paying you a regular wage, it's, it's you know, scraping together what you can. Yeah, and, and I did the medical field. I, I was in the medical field for almost 15 years. Uh, until mm -hmm. my art career finally took off, and uh, and it wasn't doing freelance stuff. I got hired by an ad agency as a commercial artist designer. And yeah. So, what was that like for you? Because, like, um, I guess before we 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 really get into the interview of asking questions, I want to point out like my first experience with you was um, Dark Horse Presents. I saw one of your uh, Predator covers. Uh -huh. a, a alien versus predator and then right. when I, I was in the army i saw uh alien versus predator first actual comic by itself not dark horse presents and you did right. a cover and i think it was the number one issue uh, actually it was, it was the, f the fourth issue that i did for issue. yeah uh i did the the one alien predator for dark horse presents that was the very first aliens predator stories and that, that was 89 uh, yeah, probably it was. Uh, pardon my corona uh, rubbing my face. Um, <laughs> nobody else is here, so uh, I'll just brush off the corona on my hand and it'll be okay. Um, yeah, that would have been about 89, I think. Um, it it might have been late 88, 89. Um, I can't remember if I had started Indiana Jones yet or not, because Indy was my first big project before um, Dark Empire. Dark Empire was uh, 1990, so it would have been 88 or 89. Now, i, I got to tell you something, admit something. When I saw an Indiana Jones, I did not read the, the cover, and I think it was an Atlantis story or something like that. Uh, yeah, that Fate of Atlantis, artwork. right. I looked at her and said, who's this fucking Drew Struzan knockoff artist? <laughs> Fuck that guy. <laughs> yeah, that's me. That's me. Now it's everybody. I actually but, uh, said yeah. that. And, uh, that. But then I began yeah. to really appreciate your artwork uh, because uh, when I saw Dark Empire, uh, which I was still in the Army when that came out, I was like, oh, my God, that's fucking good. Uh, yeah. 
Well, I, you know, I, I purposely did a, a Drew Struzan like style for Indiana Jones because that was, uh, to me, that was an accepted look for that type of illustration. And so uh, I use sort of those those little techniques that that make it more of of uh, a piece of art than you know a, a more realistic uh, uh, depiction uh, of the character. And just over time, I mean, obviously with Star Wars, you know, Drew's uh, posters once again a big influence on the look of of the art of Star Wars. Uh, that helped, but it, but you can see as I moved. Uh, into uh, other Star Wars artwork uh, for Dark Horse, uh, I I started moving into my own voice a little bit yep. more. I still had I still had some of those little techniques happening, but uh, you know I moved into more more storytelling uh, for the covers. Less illustrative, uh, more story. And right, I agree because right. I saw that with your work. Uh, in fact, some of it borderline reminded me of uh, Boris. If Boris could actually use something other than okra <laughs> in his painting. Um, okay, I'll, I'll go with that. Because <laughs> I, I love Boris, but Boris has yeah. it annoys me with his color use. And yeah. I'm like, what is with his colors? <laughs> yeah, he he definitely has a choice of colors. Well, you know, so so did the Hildebrand brothers. Yes. You know, they had they had blues and golds and, and uh uh, you know certain colors that they used in every particular, in, in every almost every piece that they used. You, on the um, other hand, I consider more photorealistic, um, and I, and therefore you use more natural colors. Uh, yeah, I tend to use more natural colors. I think because I, when I taught myself how to paint, I I started using more more muted tones, more natural tones. When uh, uh, you know, I started copying Frazetta, which is how I learned to paint, I just copied his artwork. You could see that that his, you know, color palette is a lot more muted, a lot more natural tones. Um, you know, he'll throw in you know a vibrant red or or you know something in the sky, or or he'll have like the uh, Frost Giant's daughter, where where he'll you know do almost a whole purpley thing, and then you know come in with all the natural colors, and you know use white and purple as as the contrast, and then the the figures will be natural colors. So yeah, uh, I that's how I learned sort of my color theory uh, per se. And then you know, looking back on artists like N.C. Wyeth and and uh, Mead Schaefer and and um, uh, you know a lot of the illustrators from the 20s and 30s, you see that same natural uh, uh, palette to work with. You so know, that's like what I've and, yeah, because Wyeth yeah. had a ha Wyeth had a hit, huge impact on me. Uh, yeah, as an artist. Yeah, as did Drew because yeah. Drew Drew is actually the first modern artist I collected. Before uh -huh. he was even famous, uh, I bought the Alice Cooper greatest hits. I hated Alice Cooper. Uh, yeah, his music. I mean, not him personally. Um, but <laughs> I, they gave, his show gave me nightmares when I was a kid. You yeah, that thing? You yeah. That you know, thing? I I always enjoyed going to the mall. Uh, back, you know, in in those days when when I was a kid, we had malls, um, and uh, you know, going to two places the the two the only two places that I ever went was the bookstore to take a look at the the covers of the books, and uh, you know, just look at the great artwork and and uh, you know that was a big influence on me, and then the record store with uh, all those great covers. Uh, that, that you got, and I didn't know, you know, Drew Struzan, you know, by name back then, but I, I sure knew the artwork. Uh, the, the only artist I think that I knew the name of for uh, um, uh, artwork was Roger Dean. Uh, you know, I was a big Yes fan, so you know, I had uh, all the all the albums, and Roger Dean, you know, did the artwork, and uh, uh, you know, I, I knew that. But yeah, I just it was just part of my growing up. Uh, uh, you know, without the internet, you know, where else are you going to get a large, you know, variety of, of images to look at? Well, you go to the bookstore. Yep, and, that and, uh, and, and, uh, and of course, comic book shops, because that was the third store. Well, I yeah, but, but, you know, back then, you know, I'm talking about, uh, uh, 
to date myself, you know, um, mid seventies, early to mid seventies, uh, comic book stores were just a million miles away. Uh, yeah. they weren't, they weren't close to the neighborhood. I wasn't driving at the time. Now, so, where did you grow up? Cause I know you're a military uh, kid. Yeah. My dad is military. So we moved around a lot and, uh, uh I, I would say that I, I grew up, I, I, mean, I was in Hawaii for you know, a good number of years and, and, um, but we ended up in Washington, DC. Uh, oh, and then you're in my stomping ground. I grew up in Fredericksburg, uh, just 50 yeah. miles south of it, and I spent my weekends in DC. And we went to the Springfield Mall outside. Yeah, DC. Springfield Mall. Holy yep, shit! That was okay. Uh, yeah, we li we lived in in Friendly, Maryland. It was close to Oxon Hill, um, and um, uh, that's I spent you know, 10 years there. So it was my junior high, high school years and, and whatever years I would have gone to college if I went to college. We went to the same stores. And Steve <laughs> Niles. Steve Niles went to the same stores too because we've talked about it. Oh, really? I never yeah. talked about it. I never talked to him about where he, he came from. I'll have to remember that. So next Hell time. Hell yeah. Saw. He went to the Springfield Mall and, and um, went to the same record shop I went to because there was this hole-in-the-wall corner store record mm -hmm. shop that I used to go into, and I was always looking for the rarities uh, and the yeah. imports, and um, you know, from Genesis to yeah. you know uh, some of the punk that was coming out of Europe. And I loved that record shop. And then they had this big bookstore there. I think it was downstairs, and uh, but we didn't have a comic shop there. But we had a comic shop in Fredericksburg, where I lived. Yeah. And um, but even though that, my best friend and I, we bought most of our comics from the carousel at the 7-eleven yeah that's where i pretty much got most of mine and then um uh my brother um uh took me to georgetown yeah. one time uh, and this would have been probably 74 75 and i found a newsstand uh in georgetown that carried you know all of the books and they got them in every week and they had them laid out and uh, they is I mean they had the magazines they had foreign magazines they had they had everything, so you know once I started driving in, in seventy five, that was my go to shop. Uh, I'd still go to the drugstores and the Seven Eleven and see what was there, but you know every two weeks or so I'd uh, you know drive down to Georgetown, and uh, you know check that out and see what they got because they got the underground uh, comics, they got Star Reach and and uh, uh, the underground uh, books, you know Zap and and uh, you know Death Rattle and and all of those and and uh, uh, that was that was my go to place, um, you know as uh, as I got older, I found other shops. There was a shop in Silver Springs uh, I went to and and, uh, and such. But I still stayed, you know, uh, with the local 7-Eleven and, and uh, uh, grocery store and, and whatever until, you know, I moved to uh, Florida. My dad retired in Florida, so we moved um, uh, from Maryland uh, to uh, Fort Walton Beach, Florida. And uh, he retired down there. And since, you know, I was still trying to make my breaks in the artwork, uh, I was still living at home. And uh, uh, I decided to go to Florida, you know, with the family. And then, you know, ended up in Florida, you know, and spent 20 years there. Um, and that's where I built my career, really. I just, uh, you know, kept working on my art and my little bedroom studio, you know, in the house. And uh, I just, you know, every day was just painting and drawing. And, uh, and then in, in early 1983, I made my first sale uh, to Heavy Metal Magazine. And, and um, uh, during that same trip to New York, I, I got a, a, a job uh, doing a cover for Savage Sword of Conan. And Archie Goodwin gave me a job doing a, a, a story for Epic Magazine, Epic Illustrated. Except by the time it was done, Epic was canceled, <laughs> so they shuffled it off to uh, shuffled it off to a, a backup story in, in some other book. 
but yeah, so you know, '83, you know, I got my heavy heavy metal cover, and and it really opened the door, a lot of doors, um, uh, during that uh, you know trip to New York. And those were the old days where you you took your portfolio and you went, you know, stumping the uh, the sidewalks, you know, going to publishers, leaving your portfolio, showing your portfolio, seeing who you could get in to talk talk with, and uh, you know, hopefully, you know, they'll see something that they like, and and. That's what happened with me. You know, I'd, I'd go to conventions and I'd talk to artists and I'd talk to writers and and uh, start making connections that way. And then, and then you know, I, I started making a little bit of published pieces here, published pieces there. And then in uh, – uh, are we recording now? Yes, we are. Man. Oh, okay. Uh, well, then I'll keep talking. <laughs> Hell yeah, man. I'm about to show a picture of the um, painting you did back in 84. Um, uh, there okay, uh, I'm gonna pull it up right now. There it is. Sure. Yeah, that was the second heavy metal cover. The first one uh, they had bought right out of my portfolio, and then the second one uh, uh, they commissioned specifically. And uh, I wish that I had put a better background on that piece, but um, you know, I'm still a novice, still learning how to paint, and and you know, still trying to do the best I can in in what. Uh, you know, little little freelance artist knowledge that I had. Uh, it was a good learning experience. You know, those those first five years in the business. Um, but anyway, I, I skipped a whole section in in uh, the 1970s, where um, uh, I, I spent a year at the Joe Kubert School. Yeah, because. Um, uh, I saw that you had gone there for a year and then dropped out because it wasn't giving you what you wanted. Right. Yeah. You know, I was still interested in, in drawing comics at the time. Uh, I had just started to get into painting uh, before um, I went to the Kubert School. Uh, but comics really, you know, interested me as far as doing artwork goes. So what happened was, you know, I wanted to be a comic artist and, and um, I did my, uh, yeah, that's the first heavy metal cover. Um, and, and so, you know, I thought, you know, I'll go to, uh, I'll check out the Cuber school. You know, it was expensive, but my folks, uh, uh, you know, said it was okay. Uh, I went there for a year and, uh, I learned quite a bit during that time, but I was still painting and, and Joe, who was still at the school, um, uh, you know, he really over, oversaw the artists, uh, at the school at the time. And so he knew everyone by name and, and knew what their interests were. And, and you know, you interviewed with him uh, to get into the school in the first place. So he had a vested interest in who was at the school. And they did that for many, many years. And then Joe stepped back a little bit and, and uh, let other uh, folks in his family and some other uh, students uh, uh, run the school. But back then, this was the second year of the school. And uh, in my class were, were people like Ron Randall and Tom Mandrake and Jen Dersma and um, uh, uh, John Taliban and, and Steve Bissett was in the class ahead of me and, and Rick Feach and, and Tom Yates and, and just a slew of other really good artists uh, came out of school. Uh, so anyway, I was, I was painting and uh, while I was at the school, I was still painting in my free time, uh, but I was doing the comic book stuff and that's where I learned that I was better at uh, uh, creating an image that told a story rather than creating continuous panel artwork that told a story. So all my energy was going into creating one image. And uh, Joe saw this. And at the end of the first year, you know, he, he called me into his office because we were getting ready, you know, to, to start, you know, uh, organizing for the second year. Uh, at the time, it was a two-year school. Now it's, I think, a three-year school for the most part. Um, uh, he, he brought me in, and we talked for probably two hours about, you know, artwork and, and what direction I wanted to go. And, and, you know, he saw a lot of potential. But he said, he said, Dave, you know, you want to paint. And, and uh, you know, I can see that. And, and uh, uh, you know, that's the direction you should go. But at the time, the school was only teaching black and white artwork. It was only teaching uh, illustration, uh, pen and ink, uh, pencil, uh, storytelling. Uh, even though cover art was um, uh, part of the um, uh, curriculum, it wasn't color per se. Uh, 
it was all um, Dr. Martin's dyes, which was... Well, it's, it's, a, it's specialized in what Joe Kubert himself did. Exactly, and that's why he wanted to start the school. And so uh, uh, he, you know, he really uh, knew what was good for me. He, sa he said, you know, we'd love to have you back, but the school cannot teach me anything more uh, towards the direction that I want to go. And that was really honest. I mean, this was a school that was struggling, you know, because it was a small school. They were trying to, to you know, get bodies in and, and pay for, pay for you know, having the school run. And, and here he was being honest, saying, you know, um, we don't want you back. <laughs> and uh, uh, that was probably the best very honorable advice. That he yeah. Did that. But he was that it, way. It, it was. Um and so for me, you know, that was the best decision I made. And having that uh, encouragement from him uh, put me in the direction that, that I, I eventually went into. And so, yeah, I, you know, I've that. I've seen some of your uh, story uh, stuff. And I right. think you're actually really good. Uh, well, you know, I, it, I've never lost my, my uh, uh, interest in comics, and I've never really lost that desire to tell stories. Um, but I'm just, you know, doing continuous panel is, is really hard work for me. You know, painting is not hard work. Coming up with an image is not hard work. Telling a story in multiple images is, is very hard work for me. So, um, you know, I just, uh, I'll do a story when I feel comfortable doing it, and I have unlimited time. I don't have a deadline, so, you know, I can, I can you know, take the time to make sure that every panel is what I want it to say and, uh, and you know, put it together. But, yeah, if I was to do a regular book, yeah, I'd be, uh, um, you know, Travis Charest in, uh, uh you know, delivering my books in, uh, you know, 15 years. <laughs> well, someone asked me one time that why I like doing graphic novels over comic books, and I said the deadline, because uh, I can take anywhere from a year to two years to finish a graphic novel. Right, There's not right. that 30-day, got to wrap it up thing. I hate yeah. that. Yeah, and when I did the rail graphic novel in, in 2000, you know that was a big chunk of time uh, for me. It it took me it was 48 pages, took took about six months to do, and uh, I did the whole thing. Uh, I you know, penciled, inked, uh, did the coloring, um, you know, created the cover, um, did everything but the lettering, um, and um, uh, you know, six months is a long time without getting paid for anything, and so, I mean that's the way graphic novels, that's the way image worked, you know, back in those days. How did you uh, make the crossover from, well, I mean, how did you get the job working on uh, uh, Batman Returns, which was the first bit of artwork of yours that I remember seeing? Oh, well, Batman Returns was actually, uh, you know, in the heyday of, of my involvement in the comics field, doing a lot of really fun comics covers and, and developing that reputation, uh, you know, mostly as a media cover artist. Um, you know, Batman, you know, being, you know, very media, you know, driven, you know, media tie in, um, you know, I knew a lot of folks at DC, uh, I had done, uh, the greatest Batman stories ever told, uh, hardback, uh, cover. So, you know, I had worked with Dick Giordano and, and, uh, uh um, uh, who, who was the writer, uh, uh, Len Wein and, and, uh, uh, uh uh, Denny O'Neill, yeah, and so you know, I, I was known in the industry, and so when you know when they had a, a cover for you know Batman Returns, they they asked me to do it, and so of course I said sure, and uh, and yeah, so they sent me a, a bunch of stills from the movie, and and uh, you know it, it wasn't out at the time, so I was limited to the reference uh, that I could gather you know, between what they could, could get me. And, and I'm a movie nerd, so I got plenty of magazines and, you know, stuff. There's still, you know, not internet uh, uh, access back in those days. That would have been, or at least for me, I think that would have been like 93, maybe. Yeah. Um, uh, so, 
you know, I was limited, but but what I, I I was limited to really gave me some some good imagery uh, to work with, and and I think that's a really fun piece uh, that cover. Um, while while you know, unfortunately, I I think that the legs on, on Batman you know look pretty wonky. I probably would change that if. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I put it up on screen so you could actually uh, look at it. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, there it is, Keith. But the back cover actually is what I like about that because it was a wraparound, and you have yeah. uh, you have uh, Penguin and you have Catwoman and uh, uh, Gotham City with some gargoyles in the background, and and uh, that that was really fun to do. I liked that quite a bit. So the whole cover was fun. It's just, you know, looking back on it now, um, I would have changed Batman's lower half to be a little bit more jumping out at you rather than running through the snow. But it was, but it was a good cover, and and you can see, you know, I'm moving from uh, moving from the natural tones that I, I started with, and you can see that in the early uh, Alien stuff and and uh, Dark Empire, is I started to to think of color as more of a sales thing as well. Here it is. Um, yeah. So you got Catwoman and Penguin, and and uh, I think that really works great as a single piece you know i designed it as a wraparound cover so you can see that split uh sort of you know one third you know into it but i think it really does work nicely as as a whole piece as well i concur beautiful piece. thank you um but yeah during uh during that time when i was doing indiana jones and, and uh, dark empire i started to use color more uh in my art and if you look back at at uh, Indiana Jones, you look back at, at Star Wars, at, at Dark Empire, each cover has a different color um, uh, tone to it. So one of the things that, that you know, I liked when I, I looked in bookstores was, you know, uh, uh, books like Doc Savage, where James Bama would use an overall color that would be different from the book before it. So you knew uh, when you came into a store that that was a new cover. Right. Uh, this is the this is the compilation for uh, uh, Dark Empire, uh, the f the first series, and you see those columns in the background that go up through the top. That was a, an element mm -hmm. that I introduced on on those six covers as well. Uh, was was a column thing to to just give it some some continuity because I knew that each cover was going to be a different color, but I had that column you know running down the center as a continual visual element. Right. Uh, so when I did your, the... It was that visual theme that you created to connect each one. Right. And and that was just me, you know, as an artist and, and uh, you know, composing the image. You know, that wasn't a Dark Horse thing. It wasn't a Lucasfilm thing. It was just me, you know, wanting to um, uh, do something a little bit different. As, as a... Um, uh, it's getting dark outside, so... Uh, uh, you know, I'm losing my light. Can you can you see? Can you still see me? I can still uh, see you, man. I, yeah. Um, let me let me drop the headphones for a second and turn on the studio lights. You might might be able to see me a little bit better. No right problem, back. brother. That helps a little bit. Now that's the one that uh, I I I hated you for like a day. <laughs> <laughs> Who's this Struz Struz a ripping off motherfucker? That's right. That's right. <laughs> can he can he do stuff on his own? But the fact is, uh, even though I I felt that way when I first saw it, I was like, shit, that's good. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Um, you know, I, I was at you know the right time in the right place, and fortunately, my uh, uh, talent had developed enough to where I was able to give them, you know, the best that I had, and so uh, everything just sort of clicked. Uh, that's this is what got me into Lucasfilm, 
And, you know, from there, that really built my career, you know, still doing Star Wars and Indiana Jones here 35 years later. So, you know, I'm, I'm not going to complain. You know, I'll take the, uh, uh, the Drew Struzan compliment and uh, smile and say, well, yeah. You and I both, you and I both okay. know Drew. And, right. uh, you know, because that's a, a common, because uh, it's really weird. I become friends with my, my artist because um, he inspired me as an artist. And I became friends with him because of Blade Zone, the Blade Runner fan club, because I founded it. Uh-huh. And um, right. I got to know him. Then he's like, I told him one day, yeah, I'm an artist. He's no way. So I showed him my artwork. And he's yeah. actually the only artist friend of mine that when I do something, I show it to him. And yeah. I'm still on their their private mailing list for. Do you get that? Uh, I'm assuming you do too. Get the Christmas no. card. No, no, I don't. Oh, ah, <laughs> in your face, Dave. I know, I know, <laughs> I know. Um, <laughs> what, can, what can I say? You know, if if I was out in LA more, you know, I'd probably probably be able to finagle uh, finagle on that list. But but I gotta you know, tell you. The, he inspired a lot of people, and I'm not surprised yeah. he had an impact on you yeah. too, uh, because you and I have a very similar interest in what we're doing, which is I prefer telling a story through art. I prefer doing covers, but I'm right. also really good at sequential art. Yeah, and uh, so I do sequential art, but I, I love, and, and that's why I'm the official artist for Dale Die. You know, because right. he likes right. my covers and how I yeah. capture an image from his book. Because uh-huh. I read chapter, you know, snippets of the chapters, and I'm looking for the best scenes. I always ask them, "Send me the best scenes. Let me read yeah. them, and I'll find that one." Do you do that? Yeah, when when I get the opportunity. I mean, you don't always get a full manuscript or even you know plot breakdowns. Yeah. A lot of times, it'll be just the uh, editor, you know, saying, you know, here's what the story's about in you know two lines. Uh, sent through an email, and then you got to figure out, you know, what to do with it. Uh, when I was doing the Young Jedi Knights paperback covers, uh, I would get full manuscripts for those. So I'd read through and choose, you know, which characters to put on the cover and, you know, which uh, uh, imagery to uh, uh, utilize, um, uh, you know, to make the best for the best cover there. Um, so it really just depends on the project and, and the company that, that you're working with, the art director, and, you know, how they uh, deal with the, uh, um, you know, artists and, and what they want. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it, every project is different. I'm uh, trying to find some of that artwork right now so I can pull it up on screen. Here we go. Here's one of them. Show a good one. Uh, I actually like the way you did Palpatine's face. And yeah, this. or is that because uh, I didn't read the series? Is that Cyborg? yeah? That's, that's that. No, that's Papa Thing. It is. Uh, yeah, I really yeah, like is. that one. Um, yeah, that's. Uh, I, can, I got... know exactly what it is you don't like on here, <laughs> and I'm not going to point it out because you should never point out the flaws. Uh, in I don't mind. I don't mind. You know, criticism has got me to where I am now. You know, I take criticism. If I don't like it, then I'll, I'll you know just brush you off and say get out of here. That, if, if I do uh, like it, you know, I'll I'll file it away and use it this, sometime. Uh, the young man at the bottom, uh, hit from his shoulders to his head, and of course, just the um, two sword fighters are the part that you don't like. I guarantee you. Uh, it's you know it, it's designed visually as a circle, but in the center of the circle is nothing. You know, there's this red. Uh, right under the the girl's right waist. Right behind his head. Yep, that whole area yeah. right there. Yeah, and there's nothing there, but you know, it's it's circular. You know, around the Yavin. You know, up the sword into Yavin, into the sword fight, and then back around into Luke and and into uh, Jason. And you can keep going in that circle, but in the center of that circle, there's nothing. Now I'm going to so. tell you right now. That Palpatine is so Boris Vallejo. <laughs> <laughs> In color tone, it is absolutely, absolutely. But you know that's okay. No, it is good. It's like um, uh, I've only gotten mad at Boris a few times in in his career. Where I'm like, oh come on, dude, you phoned that one in. You didn't even try. <laughs> it was like he did one that was from um, uh, the Mars series, and he put a flat shadow on it on a curved surface. And I'm like, right. you're not even trying, dude. 
That, well, you yeah, know, I, but we all, and you tell me your your angle on this. Getting rushed sometimes, you cut corners. Yeah. So what, yeah, what's the years? You do. I mean, you well, yeah. As a commercial artist, you know, one of the main uh, uh, things. Uh, that keeps a commercial artist going is a continual turnover of work. And the faster you can turn over work, the more work you're going to get coming in. Hopefully the clients are happy and, and you continue to get that work. So so you find ways of, of shortcutting uh, through your style, uh, ways of, of laying down color or using texture somewhere or using different uh, material uh, to to make that time frame shorter. And so, you know, that's what I've done, you know, over the course of my career. I can I can pinpoint certain certain times where, you know, I I need to do something faster so I make myself learn how to do something faster. And then I just incorporate it into uh, into my style. Um, one of the things that uh, you know, became very standard early on was a drying agent that I use in my oil paints. When I paint, I mix in a little bit of this um, uh, formula called liquid, and you can buy it at, at any art store. It's just liquid instead of instead of a, a D at the end, it's N, liquid. And uh, it, it thins out the paint a little bit. It's more of a gel. Thins out the paint, but it quickens the drying time very fast. Yeah, that's why I didn't paint in oil, because and I've always yeah. worked in acrylic, because it took so damn long to dry. I didn't know there was something out there that did that. Yeah, well, there's there's cobalt dryer, which is which is a a blue dryer. It dries um, uh, clear, but it's blue in the bottle, uh, and uh, Japan dryer. There's there's a number of different. Uh, um, uh, mediums that can be added to the paint. Uh, I found liquid to be my favorite uh, just because I, I like the thickness of it. Uh, um, cobalt dryer is more liquidy, uh, not a gel. Uh, I, I like the texture of, of the paint when it comes out of the tube, so I don't want to change it that much. Um, so, you know, um, uh, that was something that, that I, I learned early on. And then you know, I was living in Florida at the time, and and uh, I was trying to figure out how to dry the the paint real quick. So you know, I was using the the liquid to dry, and and it would dry you know in a day, uh, and I'd be able to work. But I you know I wanted it to dry quicker, and so everyone was saying, ah, oh, well you could put the uh, painting in the in the oven, and you know bake it. And I was just no, that's not going to work. No. That's just silly. So I um, I had a, a heat fan, and so I set up the heat fan and set the uh, the painting in front of that, and it, it was just too hot. Um, but it you know, I, the entire work area. <laughs> yeah, it does, uh, um, and you know, it would warp the board and and just not work. And you know, being in Florida, you know, it's three hundred and sixty days of sun, and so. I just one day threw the painting outside on the porch and just let it sit in the sun. And, you know, two hours later it was dry. And I went back and, you know, kept working on it. And that became a standard uh, situation for me is, is uh, using, you know, sunlight um, and, and heat. I mean, you're in Florida so that there is some heat. Uh, there, but you know, it's the light. It's just drying what's in the paint very quickly, you know, drying up that oil and and you know making that uh, that medium you know solidify uh, that much quicker. So what I've learned is um, uh, I'm going to move this camera here so you can see um, in the studio, and then hopefully everything will be fine. But um, so over here. You can see I have three floodlights. Uh, let me see if I get this in the right. Uh, I have three floodlights on top of a piece of artwork. Can you can you see? Yeah, I can see it perfectly. What that is? You're heating it up. Yeah, so I'm I'm using the light and the heat, and it's not a, a big heat, but it's enough to um, uh, uh, sort of sort of imitate the sun that I used to use in Florida, and so. 
my working situation now, what is that? Uh, my working situation now is uh, I can uh, paint, you know, and then when I'm ready to put it aside to dry, throw it under the lamps, uh, you know, let it sit for a couple of hours, it's dry, and then I can come on and, and you know, start working again. So, you know, when people ask, you know, how can I, you know, move through oil paint so quickly, you know, that's one of the tricks is, you know, being able to, to have that underpainting and, and when you get to the detail, the detail painting dry very quickly. So, you know, I can, uh, I can have an oil painting, you know, finished in three or four days, you know, depending on how complex it is. But, uh, yeah, it's just you learn the things, um, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, like, like I tell, you know, classes and, and people when I'm talking about my art, uh, you know, I use acrylic on top of the oils. Well, you can't do that because you can't mix acrylic and, and oil, you know. You just got to know how to do it. And so, you know, about 15 years ago, um, I started playing with acrylics because uh, uh, two friends of mine, uh, 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 Chris Muller and Scott Hampton, uh, use acrylics uh, uh, quite a bit. And so I'm watching them work. And, uh, you know, lo looking at how they're laying down the acrylic, you know, sometimes it's a watercolory thing, so it's, it's more water in it, and sometimes it's right out of the, the bottle or the tube, and so it's more opaque. And that's sort of a look that um, um, I use at the end of my painting when I'm, um, I'm getting to the detail areas. I'm, I'm using a similar type brush stroke. And so one day I thought, well, you know, I, I've gotten this far. Uh, I'm, I'm to that point where I'm starting to add details and, and uh, those similar brush strokes. I'll take out my acrylics and just, you know, put some on the board and see what happens. And because I paint very thin, um, uh, there's a tooth left over underneath the oil paint. And so uh, the acrylic has something to grab onto. It's not like uh, oil painters when they paint very thick sort of impasto um, uh, paint where they create that waterproof border. Uh, for me, oh, it's raining. and I'm going to close the window here. There we go. That might be a little bit better. Um, so when I paint, I'm painting very thin oils. Uh, even if it's, if it's two or three layers of, of underpainting, it's still very thin, almost watercolor thin. Uh, but it's still oils. But that tooth remains, you know, from the gesso underneath, and that gives me enough tooth for the uh, for the acrylic to to hang on to. And so I just started to use acrylic in the, those that final, you know, two days worth of work, um, because it can move very very fast because it dries very fast. Uh, I wouldn't have to wait for areas to dry, you know, put it under the lamps and wait for you know two or three hours for the uh, uh, paint to dry, I could uh, just continue to work on it, you know, six hours, eight hours at a time, and then be able to uh, finish it quickly. So, you know, circumstances, uh, uh, you know, dictate, you know, taking chances and finding, you know, what what shortcuts you can make and, and how uh, you can get that piece done quicker and, uh, uh, you know, sent out to the, the publisher so you get paid quicker and maybe get that next job quicker. Is it, is it, is the rain too loud here? No, not at all. No? Okay. Because no. I can hear it. It's on the roof uh, in my studio, so um, I can move well, it. I want to I show one image in particular. This is like one of my absolute personal favorites that you did. Okay. And uh, everything about this right. painting is amazing to me. Um, structurally, um, subject matter, uh, the use of blacks and whites. I mean, this could yeah. easily be a black and white photo, you know, right, right. You know, and I love that my eye is attracted to that. And, uh, but what I really love the most is the subject is not the largest image in the picture. No, the, the largest image is a non subject, which is the snow trooper on the right. Correct. And I love the way you did that. Well, you know, it, it's something that you learn in, in storytelling is sometimes you need a, a element in the foreground to pull you into what's happening in the background. Exactly. Uh, it, it gives that sort of sense of depth. 
uh, that that something when when you're doing a piece like this, um, it can add just that that much more to how you perceive the image uh, as as a realistic subject rather than sort of a, as a, a flat um, uh, you know two dimensional piece. And so when I'm doing something like this, which is a widescreen, there's more to it. If you can find uh, a bigger picture, there's more to it. Um, uh, when I do the widescreen stuff, um, yeah, what? Um, bah, bah, bah. Yeah, there, there's the, um, the wider uh, one. It's not as big. But you can see it's, there's much more uh, information on both sides. So, you know, as... As an image, if I took that stormtrooper out, it would sort of be flat. You would yeah. have that plane, that plane that, that Vader and, and the uh, uh, snow speeder is on. You'd have the um, the guys on the right, um, not that far back from him, and then you'd have you know everything sort of stacks further back. But by bringing that uh, figure forward, it just it just pulls you right into the piece yeah. um, because it, it, it seems like you're standing sort of right next to this guy. And, and that sets you within the piece, even though technically you're not in the piece. So for me, storytelling wise, uh, that, that helps the viewer step into the, the art. And so for the, these widescreen ones, you'll see me use that uh, quite frequently is uh, bringing that, that one close up element. Uh, yeah. Because I like that. this one, because once again, the foreground st stormtrooper that's pointing is right. right next to the viewer. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So it sets up. Uh, it sets up where the, the viewer is, you know, within the piece itself. Uh, and that was my first widescreen wow. piece. That really started it. Uh, started it for me. I really love this format because, like I say, I've been a movie geek all my life. And uh, uh, to be able to, uh, um, you know, design an image that uh, represents the ratio, you know, on a widescreen uh, uh, piece uh, is, is pretty exciting. And, you know, to do, you know, an image in Star Wars that wasn't in the film but could be is, is equally exciting. So um, that really opened the door for me visually um you know back in what 2004 maybe uh when i did my first widescreen uh piece so i've done many since then yeah and i i popped into your show today and i brought my buddy uh, uh ultra rob in to watch your because he's working med surge at the hospital and yeah, he, he took a break to watch you paint today, and it made him. It really helped him relax. <laughs> yeah, well, good. You know, it's it's yeah, like like I I make a joke of it. It's it's you know literally watching paint dry uh, <laughs> when you're watching me work, and uh, you know I I got the painting right here. So yeah, see, and you're working not on illustration board this time, but canvas. Which yeah, I'm working on stretch canvas. I could tell yeah. because when you were doing one thing with, uh, uh, you were really kind of uh, uh, brushing really tight with one of the small brushes. I heard yeah, the, scrib I heard the scraping. Yeah, scribbling the uh, color in. You know yeah. that that just goes to to my point that I'm not using a lot of paint. Um, you know, it's very thin. I'm pushing that paint around, and so. Um, um, you know that that makes it thick. I mean, when you when you look at this paint, uh, you probably can't tell, uh, but you know you you look at this paint and you could see the. Uh, oh, you might not be able to tell, but you can see the canvas through the paint. And I lo I love that because uh, I did the same thing because I always use cold yeah. press. Uh, I hated canvas. I always worked on cold press uh, crescent uh, cold press uh, illustration board. Right. And, and it just it felt natural to me. Anytime I always felt like I I don't know what to call it. I felt like I was out of my element whenever I used canvas. I, it was like I felt like I was I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Whereas with well, the illustration board, I felt like I I bonded with it. Yeah, you know, I started painting on canvas panels, so for me it was. Um, 
uh, it, it was sort of a natural thing. And the first number of, of paintings that I took to New York or I took to conventions to show other artists uh, who were you know, professionals in the industry, they said, stop painting on canvas. They said the art directors don't like to see that texture. And I said, well, what should I paint on? And they said, gesso to illustration board. And I said, what's gesso? <laughs> and, How can you and be a so, student of Drew Struzan and not know what gesso is? Well, see, I didn't know. I didn't know Drew at the time. I mean, this was this was in, in you know seventy seven, seventy eight. Uh, yeah. So I I knew his artwork from Alice Cooper and and some of the uh, advertising that he'd done, but I didn't know, you know. So him. you and I were impacted by the same stuff. That's funny. Yeah. Yeah. So so once I you know figured out how to work the gesso. Uh, that really opened up a lot of doors because I texture the gesso. I, I used to paint everything, uh, the gesso, very flat and then do all my detailing in the paint. But, uh, you know, I, I thought, you know, um, Frazetta had a couple of paintings where he had this real sort of rocky texture uh, to the paint. And... Um, I know now that that's just a build, building up of, of the paint that he was using. But I thought while I was putting on the gesso, can't I do something in the texture uh, to make it sort of rocky looking? And, uh, um, you know, I went to the store and I bought modeling paste, which is like this really thick sort of gooey paste, basically. And you put it on with a, with a spatula uh, and you can get all sorts of textures. So I, I started doing that for a while on top of my gesso. And uh, um, it, it just got real clunky. And so one day I thought, you know, I'm putting on my gesso. Why don't I just take that same brush that I'm putting the gesso on the board with and just sort of scrunch it in and, and make that texture in the gesso itself. So it builds up what, what it was. Yeah, so it, it gives me those those hills and valleys that some of this other stuff was giving me, uh, except it's yeah. it's all in the same level on the board. It's not a separate element being put on top of the gesso. Yeah, because like when um, when Drew was using gesso, I, it was very clever what he was doing too to cut corners. Mm -hmm. It's always about cutting corners. Yeah, um, he found like when he wanted to create a ring of light. Yeah, use the circular gesso thing, and he was able to airbrush on the outside of the ring, right? To create light on the inside of it, and and get that yeah, that sort of overflow of the paint coming in and just grabbing those exactly. those hills, exactly. uh, coming in. Exactly. Yeah, and 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 you know I learned uh, technique looking looking at him. He was using airbrush. I learned a similar technique in uh, in oil painting, not using the gesso. But using a brush and turpentine and just sort of, sort of making a circle with, it's really hard to describe. I use I use like a house painting brush, and and I just make a I dip it in turpentine so I have my yellow or orange or whatever I want for the sun, and then I I take my two inch brush, and I just sort of make a circle around this area, and so the bristles push the pigment away from from where that paint is and then I take a soft brush and I sort of brush out from the center and so that'll push that pigment into little paint ridges uh, going out um, geez I don't know if I can find something I think there's probably an Indiana Jones piece or something that, that shows shows that technique um, but I figured that, that out did? that you did that I did, yeah. Uh, do you uh, remember what it was for? Uh, thunder in the Orient. Look in Thunder in the Orient. Dorman uh, Thunder in the Orient. Not Orienty, Orient. Yeah, Orient. Uh, I, that may be one of those suns. It may not be. Oh, yeah, and this is actually one of my favorites that you did. Um yeah, that painting is is hanging in the living room. That's one of the few that uh, I've always hung on to. I just really love that piece. Um, but anyway, you know, I, I've also learned, you know, um, uh, through 
looking at Drew's stuff and, and talking with him. Um, let's see. No, that's not, not quite the same. Uh, that's a, that's a different technique. Um, mm -hmm. Was it this one? With the, um, no, that no. was, that was different. The light, the light up at the top was, was, uh, laying down the oil paint and then, and then just taking it off with a rag, just getting lighter and lighter and less yeah, paint and less That's paint. Really good. I like that style. Yeah. You don't add the white. You have the white of the board come through, uh, and, uh, have that, that this, uh, one with Marion, that was all acrylic. I very rarely do full paintings in acrylic. This and, is so um, Drew Struson esque right here. Yeah. Uh, I love that. Yeah. Does she do the proper outline? Um, yeah. You know, it, it's very, uh, here's, here's uh, very. Mine. Here's mine. This is one of my Drew movie posters I did for a film. Nice. And um, let's see. Illustrations, is it in here? No. Yeah, it's a like I like I say, you know, going back to Indiana Jones, it's a style that was accepted uh, by the fans that uh, I sort of sort of interpreted, you know, for what I was doing, and and you know, fans I think really uh, uh, like to see that type of of you know illustrative uh, rendering uh, rather than than. You know something more photorealistic or photoshopped. Oh, here I you go. That's... Judge, judge my shit, brother. This was 1995, my first uh, uh, movie film commission, and that's me in the straight jacket. <laughs> wow. They let you out, huh? Yeah, that was for Salt City Video. If you know them, <laughs> I uh, don't. They're big in St. Louis. Uh, well, nationally, but they're from St. Louis. And right. Let's see. This is one I did in 1993 commission for a Star Trek book and this thing was huge yeah it, it was uh, a full sheet of crescent and it, yeah it was bought finally through a uh, Star Trek convention um, what do you call it um, with a, a charity oh, okay. uh, auction for ten thousand yeah. dollars Wow, that's nice and I, I remember whispering to the guy at the auction can I can I get just a percentage of that <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I know how that goes. I've been in a few situations like that. But, uh, brother, you know, I'm not doing that architectural stuff. I'm not drawing those ships. No, thank you. That's not me. I, you know, you, I prefer you, doing faces, too, and, and yeah. people. Like, this is one of my favorites I did for a friend. Uh, Bunny Poo Salad. It's a comedy from England. Right. And uh, Yeah, it's a fun piece. And I did it as an homage to... Um, a James Conn movie from when we were young, uh, uh, Killer Elite. It's a right. homage to that movie poster. Yep, yep. Because I'm a big Peck and Paw fan. Peck and Paw, yep. So yep. I, made, James I, I used that as the yep. the model, and then I did that poster for Josh Becker's new movie, um, which is really on the cover uh, front front page. Um, this one, and it's clearly Drew Struzan esque. Yeah, I saw you post that one. I really liked that one quite a bit. It was really nice. And uh, I had to digitally change some stuff in it because uh, she was originally in this corner, or in this corner over on the left where the uh, Indian is running. That's actually my, uh -huh. buddy, my buddy Joaquin played the uh, Indian chief and um, one of the fighters. And right. the main co cowboy was the centerpiece. It was an homage to um, the shootist. Shootist, poster. right. Yeah. And uh, which is not Drewster's, and that's uh, what's his name, um, Amsel. Uh, yeah, Amsel. Richard Amsel, right. and uh, who died way too young. Um, yes, but he was more of a caricaturist in, in his illustration. Uh, he was doing a version of that person. He weren't really that person, not not a portrait. Which is the interesting thing about Amsel, because it still looked like the person to you. Right. Right. And well, you know, he, he came out of that, uh, you know, classical 1960s um, illustrative uh, um, sort of the, the New York um, illustration society thing. 
Oh, Keith looks like he wants to ask you a question. Yeah, go. Oh, I look. This is fascinating, and I, you know, <laughs> but um, <laughs> it, it truly is. Um, now, what is, what particular um, artist that has inspired you uh, has had a career close to what you've been able to put together? Because it's like you've named a lot of artists for. It doesn't seem like anybody's really had your type of career that has crossed over into all these different areas. Um, it's hard to say because, you know, I don't follow a lot of artists right now. Yeah. But I, I would say someone that I met early on in New York uh, in the uh, very early 80s probably has a very similar uh, career path that that I did was Bill Sienkiewicz. Mm -hmm. um, he uh, he was was uh, doing comic book stuff, and then you know he went into painting, and then uh, you know he got into you know uh, cover work and and illustration work, and and you know all sorts of different different types of work outside the field, and mm -hmm. yet you know is still in the field because he loves it. Um, you know, th you know that. As far as my peers go, he's one of the few that I can think of that have the same type of career path. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, he's much more influenced in that New York style, mm -hmm. uh, you know, coming out of uh, um, Neil Adams' studio and, and uh, you know, being influenced by that, uh, that group of, of artists um, that, were, that were influenced by the, the 60s and early 70s. Um, you know, I was I my influence because you know I was out of the mainstream. I didn't have all those connections. I was dealing with you know, um, you know books that I could buy at the bookstore of of J C Lyondecker or uh, uh, Dean Cornwell or Lyondecker uh, man, Lyondecker yeah. is amazing. You know, see, so that's what I think of when I see your style. You know, you have a very Lyondecker type of style, right. although yours is a little more. Well, well Lindecker's sort of an active element to it. Lindecker had a very graphic designer way of painting. Right, and, whereas, and yeah. uh, you know, I I uh, try to um, uh, introduce a little bit more pulp pulpy action into what I'm doing rather than Lindecker, who was more classicy, um, uh, mm -hmm. you know, posed type of of piece. Um, but you know, mm -hmm. stylistically. Uh, with the outlines that he used and the way that he he framed things and and um, uh, specifically the way he utilized horizontals and verticals, which is really strong for my work. If you look at it uh, in in a whole body of work, you see a lot of horizontals and verticals. Um, you know that that's just me. Uh, that's that's my my thing. Um, however, I know that within uh, doing an illustration, you need to have those diagonals cutting across to give the f the feel of action. Yeah. By having that angle, that gives the action. So you know, I'm I'm always I always start <laughs> with with uh, I say about ninety percent of the time when I'm doing a sketch, I'll start with a vertical or horizontal image, and then I'll say, no, I'm going to have to do a, you know put some you know, action in there and, you know, twist it and, and, you know, add some cross, you know, thing going on. And, and, uh, yeah, I mean, you can, you can look at this figure, you can see real hard, uh, verticals, uh, up and down. You see that yeah, the no, eyes are, no are horizontal. He, d he didn't put a lot of detail. It was his, the no. angles in the light that he used. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so line Decker is very special in that way. Yeah. Well, and, and you can see that in Drew's early work as well. Well, yeah, because uh, uh, the Alice Cooper, uh, he right. used Line Decker for that, and he also did it for the Industrial Light and Magic logo. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So he did quite a few Line Decker ish uh, pieces. So you know, once again, similar influences there. But um, here, like, yeah, the, this is my actual favorite that you did from the Batman series with Tarzan. And that was I a great series. Love the lighting on this. Um, yeah. Again, a little hint of uh, Boris Vallejo. Um, a little bit. But there's also this feel in this mask, the way it fits him, reminds me of Batman 66, which I like. Yeah. And, uh, 
but I loved these alligators or crocs or whatever the heck they are. They're crocodiles. But they're badass. That's all. Alligate, I know. Alligators have the big thin nose, and crocodiles yeah. have the fat nose. Ah, uh, you know, yeah, I like you the know. lighting on their bellies is really the yeah. thing that draws my eyes to it. Yeah, this was a real fun piece because I had to give that effect of being underwater, but I didn't want too much distortion, so I had to f figure out a way to do it in the color. Um, the bubbles rising, you know, help to give it that feel that they're not even close to the top. But, you know, I was using those aquas and, and you know, blues to, to really give it, you know, that that atmosphere to it. Uh, I, I think it really worked out nice. It, it's it's one of my it's favorites of the four. Yeah, it's a beautiful cover. Did. And it yeah. is my favorite. It is absolutely my favorite. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. That that was a whole fun series when they asked me to do that. And, and then they said it was going to be set in the 1930s. I said, okay, I can handle that. You know, I'll do a fun, you know, 1930s Batman, um, you know, costume. And, and uh, it, was, it was fun. Well, is there a, I mean, you, this is, you know, you, you brought up 1930s and pulp a lot. So obviously you, yeah. you have a deep, deep love of that. Uh, is there any particular character that you haven't had a chance to do that you'd like to tackle as far as that particular period or the genre? Um, you know, I've read just a ton of, of, you know, fun pulp, uh, uh, pieces you know reprints from from that time period uh so there's a lot of there's a lot of characters i'd love to do fu manchu uh that would be just crazy uh i've i've done some i've done some sketches of of um uh the shadow you know i'd love to do a full painting of the shadow oh um, yeah that would be fun. your style would be perfect for that yeah that would be fun um you know, I, I did, Savage I, I did, for you. I did Doc one Savage. Doc Savage piece uh, uh, early on. I think it was in the either the late '80s or early '90s. I think I could handle it much better now that that I have a, 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 a you know more um, intricate style. Um, mm -hmm. You know, back then I was still learning. I still learn now, but. Uh, uh, back then, I was trying to do some things that that I couldn't quite pull off. It's still a nice Doc Savage cover, but I'm finding it's, it. I'm looking for it yeah, right now. I, I chose the wrong colors for it. Uh, just you know, just I over I did overthinking on the piece, and so you know, I did this volcano in the background, but it, it was mostly mostly gray and bronze. I thought it would it would work. And, it, it, you know, g going back, looking at it, it might have worked in the original, but when it was printed, it was just sort of this dead gray um, sort of background, which really, um, I think, just damaged the piece, you know, visually. Uh, yeah, I was trying to do a, a, you know, James Bama thing, you know, keeping it, <laughs> uh, you know, keeping it sort of a duotone uh, uh, thing, you know, some, some of the way that, that he did. Um, uh, World's Fair Goblin, I think, was one of the influences where he had that blue and gold and a little bit of uh, orange in it. Yeah, so so that's Doc Savage. Um, uh, now, you know, I would have changed some things. Uh, Doc's hands need to be about twice as big. Uh, I found out that Bama, that's what he did, is he just drew <laughs> Doc's hands twice as big. If you look back at that artwork, he's got like these these you know meat hands that are just giant size and uh, uh, you know that's what works you know for Doc Savage so I was really trying to capture the, the Bama look uh, I wasn't trying to do my own uh, thing I was just doing doing the Bama thing you know I actually took a shirt a white shirt and ripped it exactly like you know Bama has on on his and uh, uh, you know so uh, those aren't quite the, the big hands. There's, there's, there's a couple of, of the pieces where you look at him, and he's just got, like, these giant hands. But, you know, he really just exaggerated. You can look at the, um, at the photos he used of uh, Steve, uh, what's his name, the, uh, the guy who posed, and you can see where he just built this massive structure, uh, bodily structure, on top of, of that, um, that reference. Oh. Just wonderful. 
Uh, so, so yeah, that was, you know, I, I had, you know, all so of the Doc funny. Savage books. Of, you know, because uh, you and I have mutual friends uh, that we talk to regularly, like um, Graham Nolan and Chuck right. Dixon, and uh, who have both been on the show, by the way. And, and Graham Nolan named this show. Uh, yeah. Pop, Pop Culture Minefield, that was him. And um, uh, I like having my friends on here. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. what we do is so cool. And I tell people all the time, it's like, uh, I have this amazing life that I know all these people and I'm friendly with them all. And it's like, if I'm going to do a show, fuck it, I'm going to have them on my show. <laughs> you might as well. You know, uh, Denise and I had, had a podcast for about uh, four weeks, you know, 10 years ago. And, uh, yeah, I'd call up my friends and, you know, we'd just get on the phone for an hour and just talk and, you know, talk about whatever. Uh, you know, it was mostly art, but uh, it was most ever. Yeah, you can see on this one, uh, the dead hand, that is, hand just is really big. big. That is a big hand. Yeah, I'm waiting for it to load. It doesn't seem to want to load, so I'll try to find another one. Yeah, the uh, Magi one, uh, the the one with the uh, turban guy, towards the top of of, of that. You know, I, I think his hands are really big. On oh, that they're one too. huge. That's yeah. a bulk size. Yeah, but you know that makes that makes Doc Savage, you know, more powerful looking, uh, and you don't realize it when you're looking at it. You're saying, you know, wow, this guy looks powerful. What is the, what is the thing there? And you know, it's uh, Bama knowing what to do to that uh, anatomy, to make it uh, that that dynamic. Look at that. Well, that's what really yeah. sold for me when I when I was reading the book when I was younger. Those yeah. covers were just as exciting as any of the stories. Yeah, uh, absolutely, hundred percent. Yeah, don't they? They say don't judge a book by its cover, but damn it, you should. You should, yeah. <laughs> you should judge. You should judge the art. You should judge the art director by the choice that they made for that book. Yeah, um, buddy. Yeah. Yep. So you know that's oh, uh, those are little this. things. Yeah. Those hands. Yeah, you know, make the head a little bit well. You don't make the head smaller. You make the body bigger. Those shoulders are just giant size. Those arms are just, just you know, legs of lamb. And that's, that's um, amazing looking. But but you look at it and it all feels right. You know, it's uh -huh. it's just it's just great. And uh, yeah, so that was you know, looking back on my Doc Savage, and you know, learn learning more artwork since then, more about artwork and what makes art, uh, you know, work. Um, yeah, I would make some changes if I do another Doc Savage. I have a little bit more more information to draw on, so uh, I could be a little bit more more towards what closer to what I like, which is the the Bama Doc Savage. Now, are you Way good cool. painting um, off the top of your head, or do you like using reference? I like using reference because that's my choice of, of, of styles, is to be a little bit more realistic. You know, having built my career on, on licensed material, that's a demand that the, the license owner, you know, has. They don't want to go, you know, off book uh, when, you know, they want to promote their, their product. They don't want, you know, Luke Skywalker to, you know, look like, you know, the you know teenage kid down the street they want luke skywalker to look like mark hamill so you know i i when i started i i started using photo reference and then i i found that as i got into it i needed to because that's what the publishers and the art directors were asking for is they wanted that realistic look not just for uh the characters or the actors but for anything that uh that is within, uh, you know, the particular piece. You know, the alien stuff is right out of my head because I love Giger stuff so much. It's just all, uh, you know. And this is one of my favorite paintings you did too. It's the favorite of a lot of, of pieces. It's just the the contrast between the the really fun dog, and the you know the alien there. Just uh, you don't know what he's up to. But a lot of people looking at this really, they missed the point where this is a, a robot alien. They missed the point that he's wired up, that he doesn't have any legs, that, uh, um, you know, he's just hanging there. Um, and that falls into what the story's about, which is about this company making, making a robotic alien. And they want to teach the alien uh, animal instincts, but they can't 
program that so they have it trained with a dog, with an animal. And that's how they teach it animal instincts. So, um, you know, that's where I pulled the imagery for for this uh, this book. And it's, it's a wraparound cover, so you can see the um, uh, the center line on the painting. So if you imagine that as the fold in the cover, you see the, the right half of the cover where it looks like the alien is leaning down and is going to, uh, you know, grab the dog. And then once you open it, if you're, you know, really looking at it, closely, you'll see that it's an alien, uh, excuse me, it's a robot um, being made as yeah, an alien. Yeah, once you see the back so, side, yeah. Right, yeah, so it's it's one of those, you know, play play with the image a little bit, you know, by utilizing that that split uh, down the center. So that was a real fun, fun painting to do because it's very simple uh, in its imagery. And, uh, you know, we go back to using photo reference. I had a friend of mine who had a golden retriever, and, you know, I took a whole bunch of photographs of, uh, you know, him sitting up with the ball in his mouth. And, uh, uh, you know, and and it's just one of those labors of love. The, the whole piece just turned out wonderfully, you know, from all the detail now, that's in his fur, you know, you to did. all the knickknacks in, in the uh, robot. Now, with the lighting on this, did you do the lighting in camera, or is that just something that you painted into it, the back lighting? That's something that I painted into it. Uh, I, I, you know, the aliens are so dark that I needed something to contrast uh, uh, there. And I could have done the Golden Retriever as, um, uh, you know, as more of a solid, you know, red gold. Um, but... I decided to throw that highlight in as if there was a light in back of the alien coming forward just to have that that one more level of contrast uh, and that that really brings the dog away from the background the same way that the the circle of light in the back of the alien's head uh, brings the alien forward and it also gives the painting a feeling of a Norman Rockwell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does sort of have that too. Um, you know, once again, another influence uh, I had, hadn't mentioned, but yeah, I, you know, I just love his I stuff. Used to go, as a kid, I used to go to the public library, and every, like every day to every other day, just to look for uh, old uh, copies of that magazine. Yeah, so I could um, look at his art. You know, my grandfather had, uh, he was a fan of, of Norman Rockwell, and he had a couple of art books, you know, back from the 60s, I guess, in his house. And so when we would go to visit, uh, this was before I started painting, you know, I, I would go and take those books off of his bookshelf and look at them and, and you know, just, just love the art, not knowing that it was, you know, Norman Rockwell. It was just, you know, fun art to look at. And then as I got to, you know, more more familiar with, you know, the, the history of illustration, you know, in, in the 20th century, um, all that artwork came back to me. So, you know, I can, I can, you know, trace my interest, you know, way back to when I was, you know, six or seven years old, um, you know, flipping through comics, you know, copying, copying the Hulk and, and Captain America and, and, uh, you know, just doing that, but, you know, looking at, at Norman Rockwell and, and, and admiring, you know the uh, the work there, and you know it's it's funny how life sort of circles back on itself. You know sometimes, so oh yeah, so coming back coming back to the roots, what you liked and what you were, you know, what appealed to you, to you when right. you were younger. Right, absolutely. Wow. You, you know, um, you you don't lose that passion just because you get older. Uh, you you absorb it. And uh, and find it again to to reignite, you know that passion. Yeah, because he he did that thing too that we were talking about earlier, which is uh, using art to tell a story. Right. Like, like here's a story right here. Right. You look at it and and you you see there's a story there and and in your mind you sort of make up a story of how these people got there or, or you know. Um, whose kid is that, you know, is, is it, uh, uh, you know, someone that, uh, you know, was in trouble and, and the police, 
the officer wanted to bring him in and talk to him and buy him a, a an ice cream and and uh, you know show him the right right thing or or you know it looks like he was running away from home. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a story there. There's a story in all of them, you know. But it's the rendering that makes the the story um, work. If if it was very loose and if it was moody, um, uh, it would be completely different. But uh, uh, Rockwell had a, a, a naturalism to what he was doing, and I think it made people comfortable looking at the pieces and, and that's, that's why he's so popular they they could all identify with it yeah he was he was just uh you know talking about the 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 uh, american experience or the personal experience of people at the time right right and this it's just beautiful um uh this is know, actually not, one of my favorites from my childhood seeing that one because uh, i yeah. hated getting shots <laughs> Well, you know, when I when I saw my first uh, Rockwell um, uh, gallery, um, you, you don't get the feel of how thick that paint is um, when you're just looking at at illustrations, 2D illustrations out of books or on the internet. He was laying on that paint, thick, 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 and uh, it it was it just amazed me uh, how he could do that and still have such flow of color from from one area to the next um but you get up close yeah you get oh i'm sorry i didn't mean there's a quality to laying on the paint so thick because it adds to the realism for one day but right but also there's it it's just you literally think like for this picture of john wayne you literally can almost feel that leather you know, yeah. You can, you can well, I can vest. I can look at this too, and I know Dave's looking at, it, and I can tell how he painted the vest, yeah. and uh, right. that he, you know, he did. The, it's like washing, and then you do a lot of wiping to mm -hmm. get the highlights. And uh, I freaking love that stuff, man. Yeah, uh, yeah. He uh, um, is just an amazing painter. But you go back into his early days. Uh, Lion Decker was was almost a contemporary. Um, Lion Decker was a little bit older, but you can see uh, Rockwell's early work and Lion Decker's uh, early work are, are very similar in style and technique. It's, mm -hmm. it's very, it was very illustrative. Before Rockwell got a little bit more naturalistic, uh, they had a very similar style. So you, you know that that they had the same influences uh, when they were coming up. And it, a lot of that is light, light, light. Yeah. Uh, it's not just your key light. It's your backlighting. Um, your light above in this one is uh, clearly using a light source above them. Right. You know, and it's just... Yeah, and, and it's contrast. I mean, I mean, you have these three figures right in the center of a very dark um, piece. And that will draw your attention right to the center and that's where that yeah on, on purpose, purpose. Yeah. that's where the that's where the love of this piece is it's it's right there so but he it's had also the background for me i mean when you look at this and you you you, you catch the signs and 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 you know it's the lived in look but it's the way it's lit and the way i mean just everything about this yeah amazing. one one of my favorite pieces is the general store piece where you're looking into the, the general store and it's got just a million bits of, of detail and uh, through no, not that one through the um, through the, the doorway that's in the back of the store you see mm -hmm. guys playing instruments and so you have this darkened um, uh, store, but it's light enough where you can see just a gazillion details of stuff. That it, yeah, this might be yeah. Barbershop. No, no, that, no. It's not. It's not that one, but it's similar uh, to that one. Um, but yeah, I mean, you you have all this stuff that's very cool to look at, but that's not really where your eye goes. Your eye goes to um, uh, that very small part in the back that has those characters and then once you've absorbed that that that's what the story's about 
you go back to look at everything else around it. It's like this one. He's framed the um, uh, the ball boy um, with this halo around him, this white halo. And so that's where your eye goes right away. And you look at him and, and you wonder what he's thinking. And then you know that the game is not going their way once you start looking at yeah. the background. And it's all very subtle things going on. But he knew that the eye had to go right to the subject of the piece uh, before anything else. And it's just, just amazing. Just amazing. Um, wow. So, uh, yeah. I mean, he's, he's, it, it may not be, you know, obvious, but, uh, yeah, um, Rockwell definitely was an influence uh, for me as well. Yeah, uh, same here. Uh, the artists that have great impacts on you. Um, but, uh, hey, Keith, what do you else do you want to talk about here? Because you've been, you've been letting me hog the show, brother. You've been very well, quiet. Again, you guys are very entertaining to listen to. I mean, seriously, I could just do a whole watch a whole show of you two just discussing art and technique. And well, art. you know, that's the fun part of what you guys are doing with the show. And, and you know, what we do when we go to conventions is we mm -hmm. just sit and, and, you know, talk with other artists and, and we just talk shop. And, and, you know, one, one of the quite frequent questions that I get asked when I when I get interviewed, you know, is is. Uh, what do you do in your free time? What's your hobbies? I paint. I draw. You know, it's my life. I, I love it. It's the best job in the world, and I love to talk about it. And I love sharing what I do. And, uh, you know, it, you know, something like this, you know, I could talk, you know, as long as, as, long as you guys are awake. You know, we could talk as long as you want. Because yeah, um, that's what this show is about, is really having a conversation. Uh, yeah. I liked, I, when I grew up, like you did, Johnny Carson was yeah. the guy that he was only incidentally funny. He wasn't uh, doing shtick. He was uh, incidentally funny because he was commenting on right. stuff that others would say. Uh, now, he would have comedians on and they would do their comedy. But when he came out, he was actually trying to um, elicit uh, a response from them, get them to talk to him. Right. And, right. Uh, and that's, a, a that's a good. Yeah, that's a good interviewer. You, you let your, your subject talk, uh, you, you add to it when you can, and you instigate, you know, more conversation. In, in this case, you know, we're all artists here, so we have a very, uh, uh, a very profound interest in, you know, keeping this conversation going because it's, it's of great interest to us. And we just hope it's great interest to the fans, you know, who are watching too. So, yeah. um, you know, ho we're, we're hopefully... Expecting Oh, go ahead, man. I know, you know, hopefully they haven't fallen asleep or turned turned us off here uh, an hour and, and thirty minutes into the uh, yeah into the piece. But um, you know, I like I say, I could talk for hours about this stuff, and and uh, you know, it's my life, but I love it. Check this shit out. It's Norman Rockwell doing a Pollock painting. Yep. <laughs> yep. I, I'm fascinated by that. Yeah. He, yeah, it, you know, um, but he was right there, you know, in New York during the time when Pollock and, and the abstractists, you know, were doing that type of work. So it's not like he was, he was, you know, trying to copy their work. He actually learned, you know, the concepts behind uh, abstract. I was reading an interview with him and, and, uh, uh, you know, he talked with these guys and, and figured out what they were doing. And so it's not just slapping slapping the paint on. He he made it work. And he made it work in this piece because in the center of that piece, there's no paint. There's the figure standing in front of an almost white circle, which brings that gray forward. Yep. You know, in an abstract, you would think that there there might be paint everywhere. But... You know, Rockwell knew enough not to do that because then the figure would not stand out. It's, it's uh, you know, it's it's all part of the drawing the eye to where you want the uh, exactly. viewer audience to look. And, uh, in fact, I was commending a, a really dumb movie from the 70s uh, to my girlfriend. We were watching Slithis. 
And right. uh, you remember that movie? And, I uh, remember seeing it in the theater, believe it or not. I don't think I've seen it since then. But, but uh, there was some really great work by the, the director of photography. Yeah. That um, there, it's, And then I was watching the first episode of the new season of Cardinal from Canada. And, again, the DP was doing the same thing, drawing your eye to a specific spot. And uh -huh. uh, I love watching that. Uh, when they actually get you to focus uh, using angles, you know, right? That that right. point perspective angles to draw your attention to also set a mood. Yeah, you know? I agree. I and agree. It's the and same thing with artwork. Yeah, yeah. Well, photography, you know, still photography is is no different as far as creating a visual image than you know creating a painting. You know, movies is just a series of images, so. Uh, it's it's all pretty much the same type of eye, except, you know, with movies you you have to you have to think in a broader fashion, not just one shot, but how that shot works with the whole thing that you want to do. So it's it's much more complex, but in in reality, it's just that single thing. Yeah, well, it's it's sort of like the opposite of what we do, whereas. Um... You know, with a movie, you have a bunch of time to convey that mood and that feeling, whatever. Whereas you and I have to pick that one thing, sure, in order to help sell that movie, to convey that idea in one single image, and yeah. which is why I like doing what we do. I'm, I'm like doing a book right now for um, uh, John Del Vecchio, a best-selling New York Times best-selling author, and uh, I'm not just doing the cover; I'm doing the spot illustrations inside of it, two per chapter. Nice. And it was so funny because they had me read a chapter, and I drew what I got from that chapter, what I thought was most interesting. But the funny part was I was reading it out of context with the rest of the book. So a character I wrote or drew, drew that was written in the book when I drew them was not the way they were intended to be. And so I, I drew them as being really angry and pointing at, at the students. When in fact they were being more maternal and thoughtful, and were right. more of a caring person, and I said that is why I I like direction. Sure, sure, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, and and you know that's where a good art director comes in, is uh, you you know you need you need context. Uh, if I ever had a question about you know Indiana Jones cover or Star Wars cover, you know what what should this character be thinking or you know how should I portray them, and uh, I didn't know, I would always ask. I I wouldn't take the chance of guessing because uh, that just makes more work for me if I'm wrong. Yeah, so, and that's what know, it did for me. And I got really angry at me going, why didn't I just talk to them more? <laughs> yeah, you learn, you live and learn. Um, but uh, you know that's 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 just part of the the work to get to the final, the final piece. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that goes into it than, than just sitting down and, and drawing something and then painting it. Um, you know, people don't understand you know how much work goes into it. It's just like, you know, pre-production on on movies. You know, mm -hmm. I think I think it's good that the extras on on you know a lot of the DVDs and a lot of the cable. Uh, uh, you know, networks are showing, you know, all the extras. They show the behind the scenes and how much work actually goes into it. And mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's good for people to know that because, uh, well, I, it's good for some people to know, you know, for, for, <laughs> for, for other people, they don't care. You know, they just want to go in. But I, I think for, for people who uh, uh, appreciate what they're seeing, not just as a story or entertainment, but they appreciate yeah. the work. You know, it's look, like looking at, uh, you know, a building, you know, a classical building. You appreciate the architecture that went into it, you know, the sculptures that are that are on the arches or, or um, you know, even, even modern design with, with its, its sort of abstract, uh, you know, steel and glass. Um, you know, there's there's a little bit of, of art in there, a little bit. You know, I, I prefer the old standard you know, classic look of a building, uh, mm -hmm. rather rather than steel and glass. But uh, um, you know, there's art there, and uh, it's 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 all around us. Now, I, I wanted to talk some more about wastelands because that was sure. one of them where you did sequential artwork too. Yeah, but I loved once again. Here's some gesso. I'm looking at all that texture you put in there. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. 
that's fun you know I like I like the textures I like to play with uh, play with things you know color um, you know contrast you know framing but um, I also like the fact once again going over the fact that you don't use an airbrush which I used to um, yeah I do everything digital now I don't I don't you know that's the thing that upsets me is I can't use gesso digitally I would love to well, have you, digital you, gesso. You, yeah, you know that's that's probably the big reason uh, that has kept me from it is that I can't start the piece on what I'm real comfortable working on. You know, you, you can't gesso the uh, uh, the digital screen. You you don't have that three dimensionality to it, and that yeah. for me is one of the the hard basics of my style is having that that texture to start with and then being able to see that transparency now you, you can't see it in in you know a printed version but you can see it in in the original you can see that transparency of the paint and for me i can build on that uh, because i can see it right um, wow. uh, but you know you can't do that with um with digital, you can sort of get layers and have transparent layers, but it's not a transparency that has a third dimension. And I, I know that sort of sounds crazy, but, you know, ha having painted for this long, I, I can see a layer of, of transparent paint on top of another layer of transparent paint on top of the gesso. And I can't see that when I, I look at a digital piece and put, you know, a layer on top of it and make the layer transparent. And it's just muddy or muted to me. It's, there's no life to it. So, uh, you know, I'll stick with what I'm doing. Yeah, and, and um, me, you know, it, it's just simply I got tired of cleaning brushes and my airbrush in particular was really driving me crazy. Right. Acrylic really likes to stick on the inside of that thing, and it was just sure. It was a labor, and I would get so frustrated that when I finally could paint mostly the things that I like to paint and draw in Photoshop, I transitioned. That was 2010. I transitioned from working on paper to working digitally. Right. You know, um, uh, I tried working airbrush uh, very early in my career, and I came upon the same problem you did. It was just too much work to work the tool. Um, you know, there's a lot that goes into it to get the little amount of, of you know, technique that you want to use with it. Uh, so I, I gave it up. And, you know, fortunately, you know, through whatever gift I was given, uh, I, I am able to interpret styles and be able to adapt them to oil. So I've, I've gotten, you know, this very thin blending style where I can, I can put, you know, paint next to each other and blend it together. So it has that very smooth, you know, airbrush look to it. And it's very thin, so it looks like it was sprayed on, but it's not. It's actual, you know, brush and paint. It's just my style of, of being able to smooth and, and blend it very delicately gives it that effect. Yeah, with me, I, I do things I cheat to try to achieve that effect with some of my illustrations. Like this is one I did actually for Drew Struzan for uh, Christmas. And... Um, I used, it's a simple pencil illustration that I went in and airbrushed on, in Photoshop. Right. And I used some of the spray technique that I would not brush technique to cover up the fact that I can't get the gesso effect. But yeah. Notice I used the, the Drew Struzan style outline. To, sure. You know, and uh, I'm very proud of that piece. I never sold it. It's mine. And, yeah, uh, it, it, it looks good. I mean, you did a real nice job with it. You, you know, everything is, is uh, uh, rendered really well, and, and you've got this batter uh, uh, snow thing, you know, uh, happening very well. And it was, um, all it was was a Christmas gift. And, uh, yeah. and I, you know, for Drew and I did a, a fine art print for him on really nice uh, yeah. paper. It wasn't Gickly, but it was really nice paper. Right. And, yeah. Uh, and, 
he was just so tickled by that because I did it in his style. Right. And right. He really appreciated it. And I got this nice letter from him going that uh, I was one of the few artists that understood how he did things. And I'm like, that's not true, but thank you. Because <laughs> there's a lot of artists that understand what you do. <laughs> well, you know, I I might argue with that. I, I think a lot, a lot of artists uh, tend to ape the technique rather than understand the style. Um, and, um, you know, you, you really have to be a good artist to understand what, what goes underneath that technique to make it work. And uh, obviously, you know how to do it. Um, I... You know, I've gone in, in a different direction stylistically, but I still use those techniques. Well, yours uh, is, once again, less el illustrative and more storytelling, which I like. And, right. um, you know, and I kind of ape that myself every once in a while. Um, and I think that really comes from growing up on Frazetta and, and Boris. Right. Yeah, you know, Michael Whalen, Don Mates, and, and um, oh, who else? Although um, they were okay. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. That's that's one of my yeah. backhanded things I do with my friends too. I I like Keith complimented uh Graham one day and I I was like I, I had to come back with something that was like eh, it's all right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it it's keep us um, grounded. <laughs> it it does, you know. I'm I'm very, you know, self-deprecating. Uh, you know, yeah, I've caught that about up. you. I've caught that about you. <laughs> yeah, you know, fans come up and say, oh, you're Dave Dorman. You're the artist Dave Dorman. I'm just, you know, no, I'm a guy who sits home and paints all day. You know, <laughs> I, I do what I love. And, you know, I'm happy that, that other people, you know, enjoy looking at the work. So, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate in, in that respect. Uh, but, you know, there are some artists in this industry that just have a big head. They think they're... They're greater than than the industry itself, and and that's sort of sad. Um, but you know, I just I'm grateful, I'm happy, and and uh, I love what I do. Amen. That's an absolute truth. Um, yeah. Well, uh, Heath, you got anything? We're going on that almost that two hour mark, and I want oh, to try to keep it under two hours. <laughs> I try to keep it under. You know. It's my Ross from uh, uh, Friends. Yep. There you go. You, you know you what? I, I think anyone that is a fan of, of of the Bama art and Doc Savage, we can we can let them go. So. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate <laughs> you know, I've I love his Western stuff. He he is a Western artist now. And he's producing, you know, Western art uh, exclusively. And he's produced a couple of books and, and uh, 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 quite a number of limited edition prints that, that I have. And it's just, it's just beautiful work. Um, you know, it's very, it has that, that well, you obvious. you clearly do Westerns uh, too. And because and, like the Wasteland stuff he did is really yeah, the that's, right that's, technique for Westerns. Yeah. And, and uh, cer certainly Western Imagery has been an influence on me since, you know, I was young. I, just, I, I date myself, but uh, when we were living in Hawaii and, and Dad was, was in the military, uh, we lived right down the street from a movie theater. So I used to go to the movies three, four times a week. And oh. uh, I, I saw so many classic films, you know, on the big screen for the first time. So I saw Sergio Leone's, you know, trilogy, uh, uh, Dollars trilogy. Uh, I saw uh, 2001. Those were all on the big screen, you know, uh, you know uh, affecting my little brain. Um, <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, they've, they've stuck with me. That image has, uh, imagery has stuck with me over the years, you know, to where... Do you where, remember what your first movie was? Um, no, I remember going to some horror double features when I was probably four or five years old with my brother. Uh, and and they were, these were Japanese horror movies. It was Godzilla and and uh, uh, Mothra and and Ultraman and 
and uh, you know Saturday morning uh, double features and mom would drop us off at the theater and and you know we go in and, and watch them uh, so you know that was my earliest experience uh, one of the, the very first movies that that I don't know why it made it made an impression on me, but it was Hellfighters with John Wayne, and it, it was him. Uh, uh, I forget the the guy who he was playing, but it was a, a sort of biography of this guy who fights oil well fires, and um, uh, it you know I I remember seeing that very early um, as a youngster, and and it has stuck with me over the years. Uh, I, I look at it now, and, and you know, it's a product of its time. It's not very well photographed, and and uh, uh, you know, the the stage lighting is very you know sitcomish. And but they have these outdoor you know scenes with these fires, and and uh, you know, it's very heroic, and and um, uh, you know, it's John Wayne. So that it's was that was a big deal first, for me. My first movie was John Wayne too. The next yeah. year. Um, I I went to see the shootist. Uh -huh. Oh, not the shootist. I'm sorry, True Grit. Oh, True Grit. Right, right. In yeah, fact, the shootist would have been early seventies. Yeah. I was like, uh, I think I was either still four or just turned five when we went to see it, and it was so bad an experience for me. I didn't want to go to movies again because it made my ear, my right ear, bleed. The oh, really? we sat too close to the speakers in it. Uh, it actually uh, punctured my eardrum or some shit, and I was like, I don't like that. Yeah, I I can see where that. Uh, but where, it was where John Wayne. Detriment. Yeah, it was John Wayne, and um, I think the next time I went to see a movie was over a year later, and then I was fine. It was yeah. 70, 71, and then I was an addict, and I went to movies constantly. Because yeah. like you, I had a the Will Rogers Theater in Charleston, Illinois close to our home when we were living there and my brother mike and i would go because i i grew up in a big family i don't know about you i have like small six families i have yeah. six very catholic uh, six, yeah six siblings and uh, uh I, seven of us total i was the odd one out and we would go to the will rogers theater in charleston illinois all the time to yeah go to see movies and uh good god I, I i think one of my favorites i went with my sister to see um uh, that Raquel Welch roller derby movie she did. The oh, uh, Bay, uh, um, Kansas City Bombers. That was it. I went to yeah. see that at the Will Rogers with my sister. And we just walked all the way from the house to the theater. Yeah. And I was like, I like her, she, you know, because I didn't know where she had the She had, <laughs> she like had movement. Company. She had movement, yeah. Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, I remember saying Keith, that in the what theater. Was, what was your first movie, man? Oh, I was afraid you were going to ask that. You know, ah. um, man, that was a long, long time ago. Um, For all of us. I, you know, my, my parents initially didn't take us to too many theater films. Uh, when we did go to the movies, and because we were so young, they we ended up doing drive-ins first. So I saw a lot of drive-in features, but my right. first theatrical film that I do remember was going to see uh, the Disney film Island at the Top of the World. Oh, yeah. Right. That turned right. me into an, an adventure addict. I could not get enough of adventure films after that. Yeah. Um, I still think Disney should go ahead and just give me about $60 million and let me remake it, because that is that's a phenomenal <laughs> film. <laughs> yep. I yeah, my agree. brother. My brother took me to the Charleston uh, drive-in to see Cat of Nine Tails when I was uh, six. That movie scared the <laughs> shit out of me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, my first drive-in is probably. Let me think back. Maybe um, eight years old, seven years old. Um, we went to. It, it was a, a double feature. Mm -hmm. It was an Italian movie. I'm trying to remember what it was. It was like a space thing with aliens and, um, uh, you know, these beautiful girls and these robot aliens. And it, it was it was just weird. Um, but the second feature was uh, Christopher Lee in The Conqueror Worm. Oh, yeah. 
as a Hammer film. And yeah. so, um, you know, I wanted to see that because I thought the title was just great. I had no idea what it was about. And, and I remember, you know, we watched the two movies. Um, and I have, I have very distinct visual images of certain scenes from both movies. And I didn't understand them until later when I saw them as an adult. Uh, you know, the, the um, Conqueror Worm is, you know, I, I, we left the theater and I was crying because I wanted to see a giant worm, you know. And uh, <laughs> that's that's not what the movie's about. Uh, you know, it's about witch hunting. And, um, uh, you know, I was all, ah, I want to see the worm, I want to see the worm. Uh, and and then the Italian horror film, oh God, what, what was the name of it? Um, but you know, I saw that uh, uh, you know on Laserdisc. A friend of mine had Laserdisc, so I got it back. And you know, I'm watching it, and all those scenes are coming back. I, I and and I was able to put them in context finally after all this time. Uh, mm -hmm. But you know, it was just so weird. I mean, it was a 60s Italian science fiction movie. It was so weird that, you know, those images stay in your head. It's like Barbarella, you know, oh. that that was just so visually weird. You know, you you just don't grab it when you're six or seven years old. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, that was, uh, I just went to everything, you know, when I could. Um, Lucky you. Lucky yeah, you. Yeah, I, 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 I wanted to go to a lot more movies. I mean, I'm 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 a twin, so my brother and I, our tastes were pretty aligned, and uh -huh. it was something that we could talk about and obsess yeah. over. And that's our nice. Parents eventually, got into the the thing that as we were a little older, they would go and find movies that we could go watch. That the first feature was usually something kind of friendly for the family, and the second feature was more for the parents. Because they knew that eventually right. the kids would fall asleep, you know. Yeah. But, uh, lots and lots of, of of Looney Tune films. I remember uh, <laughs> when when Warner Brothers started making movies out of a lot of their Looney Tune films. Right. And stringing together various episodes and maybe having newly animated middle bits to string everything together. Sure. You know. Yeah. Uh, like the Looney Looney, Bugs Bunny movies that I think hit theaters what, 74, 75? And uh, Probably around there, yeah. Yeah, so lot, lots of stuff to, 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 to really in, be visually incredible for the kids. Right. And then, you know, the, then we had other things hitting theaters. Like I remember seeing a trailer for Fritz the Cat going well what's that? wild mild planet <laughs> yes that was it that was it that you know even, even today i watched that movie and it just makes no sense but it was <laughs> had the craziest visuals you know for a kid you and, like you how know, i was able to find that for you i know i know how did you do it just crazy I, italian 60s science fiction I movie said, wacky I said, wacky sci-fi Italian movie with women and robots. 1968, yeah. 65. Yep. Wow. I put those years in, and boom, this popped right up. I'm like, yep. damn. That was it. You know, you got to watch it. If you, can, if you can find it somewhere, watch it, because it was the wackiest thing. And it's still wow. just really fun to watch, because it is very much a product of its time. Like Green Slime. Uh -huh. Yeah, like Green Slime, exactly. I saw that in the theater too, you know. And that 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 really got me into um, modeling, you know. Just seeing those spaceships, those model spaceships, uh, you know, because I, I I knew that they were models at the time. You just look at them and see, but uh, that really you know inspired me to to you know do a lot of modeling. So I, when I was a kid, I did plastic modeling. Yeah, you for know, me it was Star Trek. It's like my first model kits were Star Trek. In the, yeah. Back in 69, 70, uh, my dad bought me uh, AMT, I think, was the one that made the first ones, right? The Enterprise. Yeah. He got me right. the Enterprise. He got me the bridge. And then in 73, he bought me the one with Spock and Kirk, the the figures. The figures, right. And yeah. 
that was my that was my bedroom was littered with those model kits man i Klingon warbird <laughs> i had the romulan bird of prey i yeah. was i was retardedly geeky pretty pretty cool i i i built mostly uh world war ii uh tanks and, and uh airplanes uh my brother built uh, uh roadsters um my dad built um as his hobby he bu built uh, radio control airplanes uh one six scale so it was like 72 inch wingspans um uh and uh built and flew those uh he was one of the best in the country at the time um and uh you know that's part of I, I think where some of my creativity came in you know i would build my plastic kits while he'd be building his his models in the workshop and and um yeah that was some good memories back back then i'm going to well, show I mean, you plus, a rare you know you picture. had a lot of interesting television shows that were feeding into i mean when you right. weren't going to the movies a lot of kids at least you know cuz i'm i'm close to your guys' age uh -huh. you know but uh, there you go. Uh, for me, it shows like The Magician. You know? Fuck yeah. That was like my favorite show when it came right. out. Yeah, Bill Bixby. <laughs> oh, there you yes. Go. Check that shit out there, Dave. That's me yeah. when I was uh, 11 to 12. And yep. my first diorama was an M60 uh, uh, Patton tank. Yeah. I had it in the wrong war. It was uh, supposed to be the Korean War. <laughs> But, that, yeah, uh, you know, I I used to build dioramas all the time. Um, it was it was really fun. I loved camouflaging these things. I would I would make little doodads. I had uh, um, you know armor uh, 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 shell uh, reflecting armor on my German tanks like they had. You know I'd I'd get pieces of plastic and cut them and and find other little doodads and other things to make the hinges and. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just uh, really cool. It's just the cool. same thing. Like, when I, I bought the uh, first Millennium Falcon model kit they put out, it was wrong. Oh. It was all wrong. And I, I, ha I went and cannibalized other model kits so I could fix the, the edges, uh, right. the front, the fork. And I had to cut a little tiny piece of plastic to fix the cockpit because they left out that one crossbar. Right. On the model. And... Uh, and then I, I was using an airbrush already at that age when I did that. That was in, what was that, 78 or 79 when that came yeah. out. And uh, I was, like, doing the weathering and shit. Yeah. yeah. we were fun times. I really liked them. I try, I try to get my son involved in, you know, building model kits, but, you know, he has a PlayStation. Jack's, Jack's, so. oh, come on. <laughs> Jack's got to get into the nerding out. Come on. He did. He did when he was younger, but you know he's a teenager now. So he, he he's just nerding in a different way. Well, he That's was all. born in '04, Kinda. right? '04, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They Zoe was like that too. She was just like all into it, and then all of a sudden she went through her like, um, "That's beneath me now, age." And I'm like, <laughs> I want to cosplay. Oh, well. That's all I'm interested. Cosplay. <laughs> Nothing wrong with it. Yeah. No. Yeah. I love it, you know. Yeah. yeah. But uh, being wow. a dad's awesome, you know. It is. But it's not going to be too Great long. Job. He's going to be getting out on his own. What are you guys going to do then once you hit the empty nest period? I don't know. Actually, uh, we may move back to Florida. Um, I, I'm done with the snow. I'm done with the winters. Yep, that's go right. There, go down there with Chuck. And who yep. else? Uh, uh, Cariello is down there too. Yeah, Sergio. Uh, so yep. you got friends down there. There, I got friends down there. Yeah, I just uh, you know living twenty five years in Florida before moving up here to Chicago. I'm spoiled. You know, I don't want the snow. I don't want the cold. I want to get back to Florida. So, depending on where Jack goes to school, if we're shipping him out of state, we're probably moving too. <laughs> you know, we want. Uh, there He's yeah, predicted. there you go. <laughs> That's the way to do yeah. it. As soon as they're out of the house, yeah, you'll go yeah. one better. It's like, guess what? There's no more house. We're not. That's there. right. That's right. <laughs> I wonder who's who's living in the house when he comes back. We're gone. It's like that moment too when they they want to come home. And it's like I, I'd appreciate you coming home to visit, but you know your room's our new studio. Right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So we'll see. He's got uh, four more years. 
three and a half more years. So, yeah, I'd love it. We all. will see. Yeah, I love the photos uh, that you and Denise post of him. It's just great. And he yeah, looks, he, he looks just like you too. That's what everybody says. I don't see it, but uh, they've said that since he was born, and I'm just really, I don't get it. But, <laughs> you know, that's all right. I know he's my kid. Hey, uh, hey. again, you, you got to enjoy him while they're there. So. Yep, very true. Yeah, it's like uh, I wasn't prepared for when Zoe left home. I really wasn't. Yeah. I thought I was, but no, I wasn't ready. Yeah. I, I was like down in Phoenix, and I'm like, I hate this place. I fucking hate Phoenix. Why am I here? I'm here for her. I'm leaving. I'm going back to Missouri where I know people. Yeah. Because my yeah. family is down there, and I can't stand my family. I love them, but I can't stand them. <laughs> That's a consideration. I love my nieces and nephews more than anybody. It's, I'm really referring to my my siblings. Right. Uh, I just don't want to be around them. I don't see any point to it. Right. Um, and I can keep tabs on my nieces and nephews through Facebook. Thank God for right, that. Right, right. Yeah. Jack will get into that. He's on Snapchat and all this other stuff that he won't let us get on uh, because, you know. <laughs> I want my privacy, Dad. That's right. That's right. So. And you go, anyway. I really should be policing it. But then you go, do I really want to police that? <laughs> <laughs> he's had a few incidents we've had to uh, have some conferences but he's a good kid overall so we give him a little bit of leeway uh, you guys are good parents you're good people so there you go yeah. we, we try and now Keith's got two kids that served in the military oh yeah yeah. well yeah. good for them bless them and uh, thanks for their service well, thank you thank you very much it, it look it I got to say, they, they they really were fun kids to have around. I still have one at home, but she's moving out. So eventually the wife and I will. Do, do I see a gesture up. you want to make moving out soon? <laughs> 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 or this one? Well, now, now, to be fair, she is the quiet one of the three. Oh, okay. So, They're great you know, to have around. The yeah, she's, she, she is. She's almost in, in a way. She's like a cat. You know, you don't know if she's here or not. You gotta look outside <laughs> if the car is here. But for the most part, she's she's quiet. And yeah, Jack, Jack's quiet too. He's he's in his room all the time. So <laughs> you know, there's you know, if he was doing something. Uh, um, uh, productive, that would be fine. You, I mean, I stayed in my room when I was a kid, but I was reading. I was reading just books and books and books. Oh. And, um, and what is that? That is where I read my first Dave Dorman cover comic book right there. It's really? Kirkland, Washington. I was in the Army, and I found this place because I was at um, uh, outside Seattle, and uh, uh -huh. my, my unit was at uh, Fort Lewis. And uh, but mostly I worked at the um, VA in Seattle and I went off on a road trip one day looking for comic shops. And I found this place, Amazing Heroes in Kirkland. And I went into their shop and um, I think there's a picture of it on the about page. That's the front. And when I first walked into the place uh, through the front door, um, which I don't have here, it's in another photo elsewhere. Uh, the comic books were right at the front, just like this, and you were on the third level up here at the top. And uh, but I went in there to buy the RoboCop vinyl kit. Okay. And then I wandered over here and I saw um, uh, Predator, and I bought right. the Predator comic book. Going, that's some kick-ass art there. And it's the same yeah. comic shop where I came in later. Didn't realize it was your artwork. Same person. I saw the Indiana Jones and I got rid of it. <laughs> Who is this fucker <laughs> trying to paint like Drew? Fuck you. That's right. Well, you know, speaking of Robotech, you couldn't tell that from the Robotech covers that I did. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, oh, that's those are all an anime style uh, uh, line work. Those are real fun because because it was such a, a divergence from what I was doing and what, what I you know, had even planned to do, um, yeah. you know, so, uh, 
uh, it was fun to do those covers. They were just, you know, black and white line pieces. And uh, I was trying to get sort of a, a combination of, of uh, you know, anime look with a little bit more. Cool. Yeah, that's one of them. Yeah, so all of those there are mine, actually. These are totally different ever, from your style that I'm used to. Yeah, so I did, I did some painted ones. Uh, I, uh, somebody else did the... Um, the drawings on those, the oh, line work ones are are mine. I really uh, I like didn't, that. Yeah, so I really had a lot of fun uh, with those, you know. And once again, it was telling a story uh, with with those. Um, you know, I got a western one. Uh, I think you passed it. Uh, I'm going to make sure and, I'm doing uh, new stuff. Robotech. Yeah, you you had it. That last page you were on had had a lot of them. Okay, I'll go back. Um, yeah, and yeah, all of those are mine. Um, this one, yeah, this one, yeah. So I did like a, a western, uh, uh, you know, showdown uh, type of thing. Uh, that was fun. Um, let's see. Um, those were not mine. The ones mostly at the top were mine. Wait a minute, is this yours? That's me. That's Rocketeer. Uh, I never Dave Stevens, you did this. Yeah, yeah. Dave Steven, Dave Stevens designed it and sent me his pencil drawing, and and I took the pencil drawing and and rendered it uh, for the cover of uh, issue number two. Oh what my God, I, I owned that, and I didn't know that you did the cover to that. That's me. They never credit me in any of the reprints, or you know, the one credit that I got for it was inside this particular issue, and that was it. I learned something watching the show about you. I did not know that. <laughs> what, what, was Dave, what, what was Dave Stevens like? He was the nicest guy. You know, when, when you hear people say, you know, oh, he was the nicest guy. Dave was really just just a, a wonderful guy. He's very soft-spoken, you know, very funny, very personable, very talented. Uh, lived in, in Los Angeles most of his life, so he knew everybody, knew all the artists there. And uh, he's, he's just one of those guys where you just love to spend an afternoon with and sit and talk and chat and, and uh, you know, just be a buddy with you. You know, you didn't have to talk art, you know, although that's what everyone talked about because that's our life. Uh, but, <laughs> but yeah, he was, uh, he was a great guy. He's definitely taken too soon. Um, yeah. And his, his talent uh, was, was tops. You know, no doubt about yeah, that. Yeah, it's like so many. It's like it's really depressing when we lose some of these artists that too soon. Uh, it's yeah. like Richard Amsel was one of them. Uh, yeah. Died young in the '80s, and it's like wow. And I've been yeah. waiting for his documentary to come out. And, yeah, I still get the emails from. Uh, I can't remember the the director's name, but uh, I still get updates from him uh, on the thing. You know, it's coming. We're still working on it. And yeah, cause I'm know, friends hopefully. with Eric, the guy who did the um, documentary about Drew. Uh -huh. And, uh, so I was always getting those updates, but I haven't heard anything about M the Amzell doc. And I'm hoping we get to see it soon. Cause I've, I've been wanting to watch it for over a year. Yeah. Well, I, he interviewed me four years ago, maybe well, five yeah. years ago. So he's been working on it for a while. Um, but, um, you know, it, it may be stalled, you know, from financing or maybe he can't get the rights to, you know, use the artwork, uh, in the documentary. There's, there's just a whole slew of problems that he could run into, um, yeah. you know, with that, but, um, it'd be I, fun to, to be able Josh, to see that. Josh ran into that, uh, cause I do a lot of work for, uh, uh, Josh Becker from Hercules, Xena and crap load uh, of Bruce Campbell movies that he did. And, right. um, he, uh, they were making a documentary about him, and then the director went bonkers and um, got hospitalized and got pulled off the project, and a bunch of other people stepped in. And it's a really interesting uh, documentary about his career and who he's worked with. And right. it's been going for over four and a half, five years, and still the, the team quit. And so he's sitting there. He's like, I'm not going to make a documentary about myself. Right. I'll help yeah. them, but I'm not yeah. going to make it. So he's, and so I'm, I'm like sitting there going, are you waiting for me to do it? Cause I'll do it if I have to. <laughs> We're going to have Josh on the show. Cause Keith's going to send him a camera. Cause 
Uh, being, yeah. It's funny. A film director, TV and film director, doesn't have a webcam. I'm like, that's that's funny to me. I don't know why. It, yeah, it is. It, you know, but people but, are strange. People yeah. are fun. Who else did we run into with that recently, Keith? Uh, man. Oh, man. Oh. Uh, actor, uh, I ran into it with my uh, old friend of mine I met through doing the Blade Runner fan club, Blade Zone, um, is William Sanderson, which I call right. him Bill. Him and his wife Sharon, sure. they moved back east to Pennsylvania. They left Hollywood. They're like, we're done with that shit out there. And yeah. he's kind of retired, living in Pennsylvania. And, and I said, I'd like to have you on our show. And he's like, well, I, we don't really have technology here. And like what you, when you say technology, well, we don't have like a, a, a you know cell phone, mobile phone. Right. We don't have a, a web camera. <laughs> and so I'm like, holy shit! How am I going to do an interview with him? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I don't blame him. There are times that I just like to shut off, you know, everything and and just sit and paint and look outside and take a walk and not have to worry about things. I mean, for the longest time I had a cell phone, I'd, I'd take it when I leave the house and I'd put it in a drawer when I got home. Yeah. And uh, I didn't use the computer for email. I had a computer. I didn't use it for anything. And then, you know, Denise lives on the computer. So it's just sort of, you know, if, if I want to be in touch with her, I got to be on my computer. So when she sends me email messages or, or you know, something instead of talking to me, you know, from downstairs, uh, you know, I got to I gotta be uh, on top of things. So, you know, or so funny, I, I become friendly with a lot of my artist friends' wives. And you're one yeah. of them. And the other <laughs> one is, because I said, I said, I guess Graham and I must be some kind of friends because his wife follows me and we talk on, on yeah. Facebook. And Denise, I'm I'm friendlier with her than I am with you, even though I love talking to you. Uh, I find yeah. she and I chat far more often. She has access, you know, uh, 24 hours a day, really. And I don't. I don't like to sit in front of the computer, um, you know, because it's a black hole of time. You know, I, I can get just lost. You know, going through Google looking for reference images no, or you know, rabbit hole. Yeah. Or, <laughs> but I work I'd on like a computer. To, I work on a computer. I'd like to spend more time just watching movies I haven't seen in years. If I'm going to spend time like that, read a book, read a comic, watch a movie that I really enjoy, but, you know, sometimes you can't get around it because sometimes you need to use that technology to contact people. So, And I have to because I paint and draw digitally. Um, oh, do we lose? I think we lost your audio. Oh. Yeah, you got muted. Wow. Are we back? Yeah, you're back. Yes. But uh, I was okay. going to say is, uh, you know, I'm the Internet is always in the background when I'm painting and I can hear people go, I can either get a uh-oh or a uh Showing, I got a right. message, and then of course, because I'm 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 a curious kitty, I got to go look. Like, uh, the, yeah, the the ace gets after me all the time. She'll she doesn't have a printer downstairs, and, and when she works at home, she works on the kitchen table, so she doesn't have a printer. So she'll she'll send me uh, documents to print on uh, email, you know, through her email, and because I'm not on the computer all the time, a, a day could go by where I don't check the email. But she won't tell me, and then the next day she'll yell at me. Did you print out that thing yet? And I'm just, what thing? <laughs> check your email. <laughs> and uh, you know, I check the email, and it's there. And uh, you know, it's not like we don't see each other. You know, ten times a day when, you know, my studio is upstairs and she's working downstairs. You know, when I go downstairs and get a drink or make a sandwich or you know just say hello, she can see me. But no, it's send an email, and then uh, you know. Get angry at me when I don't see it. Don't print it out. So, <laughs> yeah, technology—a wonderful thing. Yeah, Denise is funny because, like, uh, uh, I'll get like weird hours. I'll get like uh, just a forward message that she sends to me of like a video of something that yeah. you know we find interesting, 
uh, because we're of a certain mind of thinking. Sure. You, Denise and I. Yeah. And, uh, and she'll forward that to me, and I'll just be giggling, <laughs> whatever it was, or I'll get infuriated over it. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, that's her life. She's a very social person. So uh, the uh, uh, invention of, of, you know, instant contact uh, is just, you know, she really relishes it because well, for what she, she does, it's necessary. Well, for yeah, for the, uh, uh, you know, uh, PR stuff, you know, um, uh, you know, the, the media stuff that she does, it is necessary, but she is a collector of, of people. And she's been that way even before uh, the computer. Uh, she knows everybody in the world. She'll she, when she's go, she's goes to work. Networking. Yeah, she is. She she'll she'll uh, come home and she'll say, "You never guess who I met," and I just no, I won't guess who I met. <laughs> oh, I ran into I ran into someone I went to uh, elementary school with who you know moved to Siberia for fifty years and and just now moved back and I ran into him at the store and. I, Okay, but that's her, you know, she knows everybody and remembers everybody and uh, just collects people. And, and so, you know, that's all well and good, but tell me when you send an email. <laughs> I, I really do. Uh, I, I relish uh, knowing all you guys um, because uh, I'm very lucky at what I do for a living, but... Uh, it's like I'm so blessed to have some of the people in my life that I have, which includes you and Denise. Um, yeah. You know, it's uh, it, Chuck Dixon. I met him because my first job for IDW was working on his comic for the A-Team, for the movie uh -huh. I had. You know, right. and uh, I didn't think I would ever go into comics. Uh, I owe that to Tom Waltz, who is my right. business partner for, for a few years. And uh, he went to the – Ted uh, – uh, Ted Adams and Chris Ryle. I was already working for them doing comic animated comic trailers for their comic titles. Right, right. And and he goes, you know, Gary's actually a really good artist. And they started laughing. They thought it was funny. He's like, no, seriously. And they're like, what the hell can't he do? <laughs> he, he composes the music for our, our trailers. He animates our trailers. He does the voiceovers for our trailers. He shoots the trailers. Yep. And he can also do artwork. Get out of here. So he printed off my my uh, portfolio and took it into him and they hired me right on the spot and I never did another trailer for him. Yeah. Good. And, you know, there you go. A real renaissance man finding his place. Yeah. Pointless to anything else in life. <laughs> no, it's not pointless because you love it. <laughs> yeah, and it's a point that's, for, yeah, that's right. That's, it's that's the main us. point in life. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I love so, that you have the alien hat on. And I want yeah. to ask you, did you put that on for a reason? Yeah, I got crazy hair. Uh, <laughs> I got I got crazy old man hair, go, you know, going bald. So, yeah, um, I don't like to uh, go out in public with my uh, crazy old man hair. Um, but I got a story about this. Okay, let's hear it. This hat was one of the two or three original licensed products that came out during the original alien film. Mm -hmm. This was, this was bought, um, uh, probably within a week. So of alien, alien coming out. Yep. And it's got the, the real scrambled eggs on the top, not the fake yeah, one. These I are know the ones where you that got that from. It, it was one of the, uh, magazines like monster. One of the magazines. Yeah. Because that's how um, I got my official Empire Strikes Back hat when it came out. Yeah. And they had like one t-shirt and one hat, I think, something like that. And so, uh, yeah, I bought it and I've kept it, you know, ever since. They've they've since made made uh, attempts to make reproductions of it. But the scrambled eggs are just all fakey looking. And, and the embroidered patch is, looks like a cheapo embroidered patch. And... Um, uh, you know, this is just, it's just, uh, um, you know, a relic of my past that I'm happy to have and, and can share with everybody here on the podcast. There you go. And I, I of course, uh, am a big fan of that stuff. I used to buy, because yeah. uh, um, my first Don Post mask was out of the back of, uh, I think it was either Creepy or Monster. And, right. Uh, and Monster was where I bought 
the um, uh, Empire Strikes Back I used to wear. It's gone now. I have a picture of it actually on my Facebook page. Um, I'm not going to bother looking it up. It's it's uh, gone with my first right. divorce. My very yeah. first divorce. It just disappeared. yeah, the divorce. Yeah, I know all about that. Yeah, but uh, now I just pretty much wear these hats, U.S. Army. Uh, yeah, because I like to support my veteran buddies. Can understand that. And as a veteran. And Keith wears uh, the uh, caps he wears because he's uh, uh, secretly he's an English racer, race car driver. Ooh, okay. And now I the was, secret's out. I was just told that this was the best cap for me to wear. That somehow. <laughs> yeah, that's from our friend Craig, uh, my childhood friend Craig, who was uh, working with us for quite a while, uh, helped us uh, get things going in the right direction for the show. And he told me not to wear hats anymore. And but told Keith that he loved that hat on him. And yeah. So I'm there like, you okay. go. And he's an, F, right. he's an FX guy. Uh, works in uh, CG effects. Uh, he did uh, the dogfight series for history. Oh, I love watching those history uh, document uh, documentaries. Yeah, now that, now that they got this cool you know computer graphic stuff going on, I just love those. Mm -hmm. and you and know, you get you get. You get tired of seeing that same old footage over and over again, and uh, you know that tank rumbling can, across exactly, the open field. Exactly, how or, he creates stuff. Yeah, um, and then he did that other series, uh, Earth After People, I think was the name of it on History. Oh, I saw that. Yeah, he did all that was the effects for that. Yeah, that was real interesting. I I, I thought it was quite uh, informative. Um, yeah, and so he's and, and fun to watch. Told actually, Keith, yeah. He's the one who told Keith yeah. to wear that cap. So every show Keith looks, man. Like, looks like Jackie Cooper or Jackie. Yeah. The, 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 the famous Stewart. Stewart. Jackie, Jackie Stewart, yes. If it's not Scottish, it's crap. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's oh, right. you know, on multiple levels, that's funny, but it also shows how old I am. Uh, we're all getting old. Yeah, we hit our 50s and... Uh, because I've never asked you your age. I don't think I've ever looked at it. But I'm 56 going on 57. Uh, Keith is just in his 50s. And uh, I'm assuming uh, and you I'm are, older. Yeah, yeah you're older. between my age and 65. Answer the door. So, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, making noise. She's walking yeah. in the room. It's um, my um, stepdaughter. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I won't ask what the rabbit ears are for. Um, it's quotes. Yeah, because we're yeah. not married, but I still cool. refer to her as my stepdaughter. Yeah, um, I'm. I'll be sixty-two this year. Sixty-two. That's really fantastic. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. I'm the old and guy. For, for the and record, I, I'll be fifty-three later on this year. Not bad. Ah, uh, he's just but, a pop. And then not bad. You still get you, you you still got the black in your beard. I lost my, I lost my color about ten years ago. I started uh, just that gray just started coming out, and that was it. That was that was over for me. So well, uh, hopefully I yours will last a little bit longer. Well, well, see, you know what? Black doesn't I'm age to begin with, and so he looks young. He looks <laughs> like he's in his late thirties, early forties to me. Oh, uh, you are way too nice, and the check is in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, I just wish and, I felt like that. And you know what's really funny? I, I want to tell you something, uh, Dave. Meeting Keith when we first met, we met, I was a guest, guest of honor at VisionCon, which he worked at. And so he was. Al I was always sitting down and looking up at him. And uh, so, like, as we became friends, and then, like, or we'd be sitting together. And finally, when we started doing this, this show, I was standing next to him one day, and I realized... I'm looking at him that rather than down at him because I'm taller than right. everybody when I meet them. I'm, you know, six foot three. And mm -hmm. he's like, um, I'm looking at him. I said, how tall are you? And he goes, I'm six foot one. I'm like, bullshit. I'm six foot three. And I'm looking slightly up at you. <laughs> so we had to measure him at my house. Oh, really? <laughs> so my buddy Travis and I pulled out a, a tape measure and measured. It was like, dude, you're six foot three. Over six foot three. <laughs> he didn't even know how tall he was. How, well, I mean, you know, he's, 
Yeah, it's, it's all right. He's, he's got that view from the top of the world. So I, I, I see everybody the same. So. <laughs> and, I get, and I'm so tickled when I meet somebody my height because or taller. Yeah. I, I, it's like when I have to do straight across or look up at somebody, I'm in awe. Yeah. I, I just don't want to let that person go. Please talk to me some more. Because <laughs> I'm used to seeing the tops of people's heads. Right. No, I can understand that. Yeah. How tall are you? Five nine, so, so you'll, you'll be looking height. down. Yeah, so you're the same yeah. height as uh, uh, two of my siblings, uh, male siblings, and all of my sisters are about your height. And uh, yeah. my oldest sister or middle sister was the tallest. She was uh, six foot when she was younger. And, wow. Uh, wow. But uh, I tower over everybody in my family. They don't know where it came from. Um, yeah. And my nickname is Little Gary. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Of course. Which I still like. I like it when they call me that. All my cousins yeah. and everybody. Yeah. Because it's an homage to my dad because he was Big Gary. Yes. Um, but uh, I guess let's sort of wrap this shit up, man. <laughs> I enjoy talking to you so damn much. Um, yeah, it, it, it was fun. I know that uh, the family's downstairs waiting for me to go to, and yeah, get I'm dinner going. Denise so. didn't. Denise, <laughs> I invited her to join us. I'm surprised she didn't join us. Oh, uh, she's, she's busy meeting people. Probably she's busy, you know, chatting on on uh, you know Facetime or or right. or you know on Facebook, you know, s sending uh, uh, you know forwarding stuff that she finds funny. Don't don't be surprised if you got a whole bunch of stuff waiting for you on your phone. <laughs> hey, tell her uh, hi for me, please, Dave. I will do that absolutely. Uh, she's, she is really your wife is really one of my favorite people. I always look forward Thanks. to her comments. Or her uh, posts in our little super duper top secret group that we're in. <laughs> it's Fight she Club. She loves us. It's Fight Club. <laughs> All right. I won't mention it. All right, Dave. Uh, thanks for coming on. Uh, I deeply appreciate it. Thank and you so much. I guess Dave. we'll sign off. Thank you. And, yeah, uh, my pleasure. You know, I, I appreciate it. Hey, hold on just one second. Yeah, man. Hello. Uh, what was that? Are we going to eat soon? Tell her Gary says no. Gary says no. Who? <laughs> I'm still I'm still on the interview. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. Now you're on the interview too. <laughs> so, all right, I'm going to hang up. I'll be down in like 2 minutes. No yeah, okay. See ya. <laughs> Talk about uh um you know, reading my mind. So, <laughs> yep, time for dinner. You know, call Dave, get him down there. Well, so. Dave, you take care of yourself. You guys take, stay healthy, quarantine, and because yep. uh, uh, you are like me, we're high risk. And yep, we absolutely. We've been around for a long time, brother. I got uh, good people looking after me. So good, good. So I'm good. All right, it, it, it has been a very, very, very distinct pleasure meeting you. Thank, Thank you. you, Keith. Hopefully, we'll meet in person someday. And, I would uh, love that. Yeah. Well, we plan to and, do more cons. So. Okay. Well, as soon as uh, you know when the world gets back to normal, it'll be nice to to get back seeing the fans. Amen to uh, that. Anyway, thank you for having me. It was nice to uh, be able to you know speak from the studio to everybody out there, and and um, uh, it was a good time. Next time, I'll uh, hopefully have a little bit uh, better lighting set up. I'll get my stage manager in here, and uh, we'll set something up. All right, you take care, Dave. And uh... hey, guys, thanks for watching Pop Culture Minefield. If you've enjoyed the show, please remember to like and subscribe, and don't forget to hit the bell icon. Remember, you can find us at Pop Culture Minefield on both Facebook and Instagram. Thank you again.
Y'all come back now, you hear?